Welcome to Safe on Deck. For episode 45, I sat down with Lieutenant Colonel Rich Peace at the 100th Fighter Squadron in Montgomery, Alabama. Lieutenant Colonel Peace joined the Air Force Reserve in April 2002, and after being selected to train as a C-130 Hercules pilot at Maxwell Air Force Base, he executed an exceptionally rare Air Force Reserve to Air National Guard unit transfer to fly the F-16 Fighting Falcon at the 187th Fighter Wing. Lieutenant Colonel Peace has executed five combat deployments in the F-16, flying missions over Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. On December 5th, 2023, Lieutenant Colonel Peace delivered one of the first three Alabama-assigned F-35A Lightning II jets to Danley Field, marking a major step forward in the 100th Fighter Squadron's long-awaited unit conversion to the new fifth-generation Stealth Fighter. Lieutenant Colonel Peace currently serves as the 187th Fighter Wing's Operations Group Deputy Commander. Lieutenant Colonel Peace is a command pilot who's logged more than 3,000 hours in the F-16C and the F-35A, and he's a Boeing 757 and 767 captain and instructor at a major U.S. airline. Lieutenant Colonel Peace is a founding board member of the Red Tail Flight Academy and the Red Tail Scholarship Foundation, dedicated to advancing aerospace career opportunities for minority and under-resourced high school and college students to help continue the storied legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen. Thanks for taking the time to listen. In the future, I plan to continue to share similar interviews with both current and retired military aviators. If you have a question or a suggestion for a future interview, please leave it as a comment below. Safe on Deck, Episode 45, with Lieutenant Colonel Rich Peace. Enjoy. Sheriff, I was trying to think how many years we've known each other. I actually, I'm not good at doing math in public, so I won't try, but it's been a couple. I want to say thank you so very much for sitting down. You were one of the first people I asked to do the podcast. So first off, thank you for doing it. Second off, uh, start all the interviews the same way, so we'll start yours the same way as well. Where were you born? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, first of all. I'm glad we actually finally got to make this thing work out, but I was born at Blyville Air Force Base in Blyville, Arkansas, which is now just a little tiny town with a big-ass runway, but it was a SAC base back in the 70s, probably through the 80s, and my parents were both Air Force. They were stationed there, so uh, that's where I made my, my first appearance. Awesome. What did the family do in the Air Force? My dad was a personnelist and my mom was a air vac nurse. So uh, mom's a Vietnam vet. Dad is uh, did a lot of good stuff. And he finished his career in the reserves doing selective service. Mom finished active duty. I think her last assignment was Peterson Air Force Base doing uh, OBGYN nurse work at that time. So Vietnam vet doing air vac stuff. C-130s, intra theaters, then C-141s, intra theater, right? So pretty cool to kind of share that lineage. My brother and I kind of split the difference. So I became a pilot. My brother's a flight doc. So so we just kind of took mom's job and kind of split the difference and, and here we are. So That's incredible. Well, I know yeah. so many folks that either had great experiences or terrible experiences and some of the ones that had great experiences followed in the footsteps and others maybe did not. Sounds like you did. Was it a good childhood work remembering hearing, hearing those stories? Was that maybe the impact or the influence? Yeah, I think it was a really good experience. I think being an Air Force brat has a lot to do with who I am today. I do really well with people. I, I've been told I've never met a stranger kind of thing. I think that's just from growing up in the Air Force. You just move around a lot. You get used to meet new people, make new friends. So for me personally, I think it kind of set me up for where I am now. I'm actually surprised that I even made it here, to be honest, even with the Air Force background, but just with the the amount of exposure, you know, as a black pilot, I just never really met black pilots, even living on Air Force bases my whole life. So getting to fly was not something that I really thought was, you know, something that was going to be my future, to be honest. Certainly not flying fighters. I'm happy that I actually ended up here and got the chance to do this job. We could talk more about my scholarship program later. Absolutely. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of the reason I started the scholarship program in Tuskegee is just to give disadvantaged kids and, you know, minorities, ethnic minorities, the opportunities to get into aviation earlier, younger, it may be a little bit easier pathway so that we can try to increase the numbers of, you know, minority pods that are out there. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. And we'll go down the rabbit hole if that's okay. And we can, we'll, okay. we'll yeah. find our way back to your history. <laughs> but people talk about like representation is important. Is that true? Is that something that you, if you don't see someone that as silly as this sounds, it looks like you, it makes it harder to see yourself in their shoes and do that job? I think it's vitally important. The thing I think about most is the fact that we've actually exposed a lot more kids to aviation careers than even the kids in our programs. So a good example I like to give is we had a young man who was in high school when he joined our program, ended up going to the Air Force Academy, left there, he's at Auburn now. He did his prom proposal, which I guess is a thing kids do now, right? Like they made a big deal of the prom, but 
Uh, he did his prom proposal to his girlfriend on an airplane and videotaped it and all that kind of stuff. But the fact that he did that, all these kids in his high school who probably never even thought about the possibility of flying or having an aviation career now kind of have that seed planted in the fact that one of their classmates is flying and that it's a possible career for them in the long run that maybe they weren't thinking about before. So while this 65, 69, however many students we put through the program so far, that set all of those students up for successful aviation careers for sure. I think all of the people around them that have been exposed to aviation as well is going to also help increase the number and increase that exposure that you're talking about. So the scholarship program itself, I want to make sure we unpack exactly what it is. Could you talk a little bit about it? Red Tail Scholarship Foundation is the name of the overarching program. And then the Red Tail Flight Academy is our flight school that's in Tuskegee, Alabama. And basically what it is, is my co-founder was the ADO, the Assistant Director of Operations at the time. I was just kind of a flying Elvis in the squadron. We're here in Montgomery, Alabama, which is where my guard base is. And we're sitting in the heritage room one day, formerly known as a bar, now known as the heritage room, right? We're sitting in the heritage room and we're kind of looking around and going, there should be more black pilots. I mean, almost 50% of our base is African-American. We couldn't figure out what was keeping us from having more than just one black pilot. So I was the only black pilot in the squadron for 14 years. Then we've had as many as four in the squadron. And now I'm back to being the only black pilot again, right? So we were just kind of looking at that and figuring out how we could change that, how we could fix that or make it better. So we... Just two dumbass pilots just kind of went out not knowing anything about anything and started the scholarship program. And at the time, we just figured, you know, we'll try it. And if we fall flat on our face and we get one kid through the program, that's just one more pilot that might not have been otherwise, you know. So we started the program and here we are going on almost six years later, 70-ish students later, programs going strong. So far, it's been no corporate investment in our program either. It's just guys like you going, hey, this is awesome. I want to help out. You know, here's 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever guys can give. And I just talk to my buddies and people go to our website or they see other things and they just decide to kind of chip in and help out. So just from the fundraising standpoint alone, it's pretty amazing that we've gotten as far as we we have. So I'll editorialize. I try not to, but I'm guessing you see in their eyes what you were at that age. People that have a lot of hopes and dreams, but they need something to kind of get them to the next level. If that flight training gets them potentially a better shot at the academy or, you know, flying another career later, that's something that opens the door and you're opening it for them or helping them open themselves, I guess. Yeah. So we we don't necessarily target military flying. I have about 50% of my students who want to fly military. A lot of those students tend to be ROTC students and things like that. And about 50% of the students really just want to be commercial aviation people. Both my co-founder and myself were both military military pilots and commercial pilots, right? So we can kind of talk to both those career fields and mentor those students towards either one of those goals. It's been, you know, pretty successful. It's worked out. We have, let's see, three students now who are flying for major airlines. we got a couple more that are flying for some of the mid-majors, and we have six or seven that are flying in the military right now. So, so far, it's been pretty successful. If it all falls apart tomorrow, it would have been worth it. Absolutely. You know, so. you know, I, I get the feeling it won't, number one. <laughs> Is there a name or a face or anyone maybe we could talk about that, uh, that one of those folks that was a success? So the student that, that immediately stands out. There's there's kind of two. So the first one is a young man named Torius Moore. And he is right now, uh, he's a FAPE at Columbus Air Force Base. And he was our very first student. We have just, you know, through the military connections out here, we started the program, said, hey, we're looking for students. And one of our old pilot buddies was like, I've got just the guy for you. Torius had already started flying with him and he brought Torius to us. He ended up being our first chief pilot of the program. You know, he was 50, 60 percent through his pilot private license at the time. So we finished up his private pilot's license. He ran our program for several years. He's a Tuskegee student. In fact, we actually started the program here in Montgomery. And Torius just happened to be a Tuskegee student flying at the FBO here. And he brought so many more students from Tuskegee into the program that it made more sense to move the scholarship to Tuskegee instead of actually just doing it in Montgomery, right? So we ended up moving up there, which was, in hindsight, turned out to be the best thing we possibly could have done. So we made him an instructor. Then he taught in the program, ran the program for a while until he finally commissioned on his ROT and went off to the Air Force to do great things. And then the second student I'll bring up is a young man named Daniel Kroom. When we first started, one of our requirements was you'd have to be a student because we didn't want people who were out of college who had the ability to make money into the program, taking money away from other students, just because we didn't have a lot of money to start with. So we wanted to make sure we were doing the most that we could with it. When Daniel first interviewed with us, he had just graduated from Tuskegee. So we told him we were not going to give you any flying money, but we'll still offer the mentorship and the other parts of the program, the networking, all this stuff, as much as we can to help you out. Well, what happened was every time I would go to the FBO, I would see Daniel at the FBO grinding, studying, working, flying, and he was just working 
working so hard towards the goal that we were finally just like, we'd be idiots not to help this guy because he's working so hard and he's doing so much. And so we did. We just added him to the scholarship just out of nowhere. It was like, okay, congrats. We're paying for your flying from now on. And he did really well, became an instructor, built up his time, flew for, I can't remember what regional, I want to say maybe Pinnacle or something like that. And now he's flying for a major airline in the Southeast. Super proud of him, the same airline that I work for, right? So I remember when he had 0.0 flight hours, right? Now he's flying for a major, doing really big things. So super proud of Daniel. So all, proud of all the students, really. And not all make it to those levels, right? Aviation is tough. It could be a challenge. But seeing just even some of these successes and what some of these young men and women are going to go off and do in their professional careers is pretty exciting. It's rewarding to be even a small part of that. Well, I was going to hoping to get to this at the end, but I'm glad we got it to it at the beginning. Because yeah, I, I did want to say thank you, man. Like, you're looking at the next generation and saying, I see the motivation and I want to help you out. Like, cause let's be honest, right? You're, you're, you have tons of free time, plenty of, absolutely not, right? You have no free time, yet you're choosing to spend the time that you have when you're not with your family, not with the squadron, doing something like that. So first off, thank you for doing it. Yeah, I appreciate um, it. We'll, as they say, put it in the notes below, all the, the links and everything to the, uh, the website. But yeah, like I said, thank you. And I'm glad we talked about it first. Yeah, I guess for your listeners, if, if you really want to, to make a difference and you want to know that you're donating something that's really going to change a trajectory for someone, www.rtfa.org. That's Romeo Tango Foxtrot Alpha.org. And just check us out. And if you think it's worth your time, then we'd appreciate anything you're willing to give. $5 a month goes a long way. So thanks for the platform, I guess, to talk about the scholarship right off the bat and just cool. uh, hope to keep it going. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's talk. Let's get back to Sheriff. Uh, well, hopefully no. we'll talk about the call sign here at the end. Uh, but yeah, so we talked about the family touch points. The Air Force has been mentioned, so I, I get the feeling I understand why you're not going to be a naval aviator, maybe a Marine. So I understand why you're heading in that direction. What was the first touch point on aviation for you? Do you remember? Honestly, I can't point to any one particular point in time. I just think just growing up in the Air Force, just growing around the airplanes, just somewhere in there that he was planted pretty early. From as young as I can remember, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I don't know where that came from or why. I don't even remember being based at any fighter bases per se. Although, especially when I was younger, there were a lot more fighters around and they would kind of hop from base to base. So I would see them. I'd see the F-4s flying all the time. The F-16s flying all the time. That became a thing. And it just looked like something that'd be really cool to do. So I always had an interest in it. I never actually thought I would actually do it, to be honest. In fact, even the way that I ended up flying is kind of almost a fluke, but... Uh, well, not even almost. It's definitely a fluke. But, uh, you know, I think God has a path for everybody. And I, and I just, no matter how hard I tried to get away from being an Air Force pilot, it just kept showing up and showing up and showing up until I finally took the hint and went ahead and did it. Well, before we get to the flying side of it, one thing that I think is kind of especially unique about you from some of the folks that I've had the chance to sit down and talk with is uh, a little bit of a touch point on professional sports. Maybe, hoping maybe you could kind of tell uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, man, that was so long ago. Um, <laughs> I've seen the photos. You look almost identical now in front of me to those photos. Photos. Yes, I appreciate your <laughs> lies. <laughs> So always somewhat athletic, I guess. My dad was a college baseball player, played a little bit in the Mets baseball program as well. My brother also played baseball, so I guess I'm just kind of the black sheep of family, straight off, started playing football. I didn't have much talent, but I had a lot of heart, so I think that yields itself to football quite well. I actually started playing football as a freshman in high school. I went up to the head football coach on the first day of school, right? And I said, hey, I think football sounds fun. I'd, I'd like to play winter tryouts. <laughs> He's like, well, they were about three months ago. but So he put me on the team because nobody says no, right, in high school. I got the last little bit of equipment that was just in the back corner of the equipment room. I had a suspension helmet, which you probably don't even know what that is. It was basically the shell of a helmet with a piece of leather in the middle and like six shoestrings that were tied to it that the shoestrings with the leather on it kept your head from hitting the side of the helmet. That was, it was terrible terrible piece of equipment. So that my freshman year, I was on the freshman team. I played defensive end, never touched the field, never even saw the field until the very last game of the season. They put me in for, I think, two or three plays and actually got a sack on one of those three plays, which is crazy. But the next year, my sophomore year, I moved to cornerback and I was on the JV team. So I was playing JV at corner. Uh, I ended up becoming like a backup cornerback on the varsity team. So I would play JV, then dress out for varsity. And for whatever reason, by the fourth game of my sophomore year, I was starting on varsity. So I started on varsity as a corner as a sophomore and junior in high school. Senior year, I moved to free safety, and then we got a new head coach. So we went from the power eye offense to a spread offense. So I also started playing wide receiver. So I ended up starting both ways as a senior. Enough schools decided I was good enough to offer me scholarships. So I had several scholarship offers. And being the nerd that I am, I built just this big spreadsheet with all the pros and cons of the schools and the locations and their engineering program, which is what I wanted to do their football program, proximity to home, yada, yada, yada. So I kind of run down the whole list and the Air Force Academy actually came up first and Wyoming came up second. 
And there were some others. Washington State, I think, was third and on down the list. So ultimately, I got an appointment to the Air Force Academy. I actually got an appointment to all three service academies, believe it or not. But I had a godbrother. So my younger brother's godparents, his son, their son, was at the Air Force Academy. And he was just like, dude, don't go to school here. He's like, just go to regular college, drink beer, chase girls. Like, don't come to the academy. So he kind of talked me out of it. The other thing he talked me out of it, so I really wanted to fly, as we talked about. At the time, the Cold War had ended. A lot of pilots were getting banked. They were cutting way back. There was a senior from my high school who was a senior at the Air Force Academy named Scott Hufford, who play, also played wide receiver. He was the only football player in 1992 off the academy team to get a pilot slot. And so my thought was, if I'm gonna go to college four years and go to the Air Force Academy to not get to fly at the end of that, I, I kind of didn't really want to do that. As it turns out, things turned around a couple years later. If I'd gone, it probably would've worked out, but uh, I ended up going to Wyoming and taking the football scholarship and studying engineering instead. Ended up, you know, pretty solid season there and ended up, I guess, being a little bit better than I anticipated. So I had a short opportunity in the NFL, didn't really work out, got released after a couple of preseason games, played in the Canadian Football League for a little bit, and then wrapped that up and got back to, you know, my engineering job. So you mentioned engineering. Where did you, yeah. uh, you work? So I started out at a small uh, mechanical design of buildings company called Cater Ruman Associates in Denver that you've never heard of. And then I left Cater Ruman to go work at a nuclear power plant in Texas called Comanche Peak Steam Electric Station in Glen Rose, Texas. Did that for a few years. Still just really wanted to get back to aviation. So around, gosh, I'm trying to think what the year it was. I guess it was around 2000, I left the nuclear world and went started working for a major airline in the Southeast, just as an engineer. So I was in the tech ops division, just doing engineering work, basically maintenance engineering. And then uh, September 11, 2001 happened. Do you remember where you were that day? I would remember exactly where I was. I was sitting in my cubicle. I'm working for an airline, right? So an airline flying into a building is kind of a big deal. So we were all scrambling, trying to watch what was going on. I remember... I don't even know, if, was Fox News even a thing back then? I don't remember, but we were trying to get to CNN and we were trying to watch this, but CNN was blocked on all the computers at my job. Somehow we got to BBC, BBC wasn't. So we were all crowded around some computers watching the news coverage on BBC, seeing what happened. And I'm sitting there when the second plane hits, just watching it on a computer on BBC. And that was immediately when I was like, okay, this is a tag. Kind of like everybody else, right? It's kind of the same experience. So I remember exactly where I was. And it was um, pretty profound because at the time there were some other things going on at my job where there's kind of a group of us who we started our own little secret military operation. We called it Project Gone, which stood for Get Out Now. <laughs> And because we were all kind of looking for other avenues to kind of take our talents. And one of the guys who was part of that deal, who worked systems engineering with me, was telling me about the reserves. His plan was to go to reserves and start flying, which he actually never did, but he told me about it. So I remember not long after 9-11, I went over to Dobbins in Atlanta and I went up to a recruiter and I was like, hey, I heard this thing about the guard. Like, I want to join the guard, right? <laughs> and then she's like, well, that's, that's not really how it works, but here's a list of guard bases, right? So you can go call these guys and they're the ones who hire you. So I start making phone calls. And ultimately, I end up at Maxwell Air Force Base flying C-130s. So I get the list. First thing I see is F-16s in Montgomery. I'm like, yeah, I want to fly F-16s. So I call Montgomery. I don't even know who answered. I don't even know what phone number I called, but I called the number on the sheet. And I said, hey, I want to come fly F-16s with you guys. And they said, well, we're only hiring current qualified guys. Sorry. So the next thing on the list that I wanted was B-1s at Warner Robins. It's like, yeah, B-1 would be sweet. I can't remember if they were guard or reserves. I think they're reserves. So I called up Warner Robins and I said, hey, I want to come fly your B-1s. They said, well, that's great, but we're switching over to the J-Stars. And I was like, ah, I'll get back to you <laughs> on that one, right? And then uh, the third phone call I made was actually to Maxwell. And I said, uh, hey, I want to come fly your C-130s. They're like, sweet, we have a board on Saturday. Can you make it? Like less than a week. I was like, yeah, I think I can do that. So I got that all scheduled. And then the next squadron on the list was the Savannah C-130 guys. So I called the Savannah guys and said, hey, I want to come fly your C-130s. And they said, we have a board in a month. Can you make it next month? And I said, sure can. I'll see you next month. Well, that Saturday, I drove down to Maxwell. I did the interview. Uh, after my interview, you know, they said, hey, we have some chief who's retiring, hamburgers, hot dogs, whatever, have a couple of beers, hang out. Now, at the time, I'm 29 years old, right? So I'm kind of right at the end of the window. And so I'm just kind of sitting there, hanging out, talking to somebody. And I, I just got a tap on the shoulder. They're like, hey, can we talk to you for a second? So they brought me back to the DO's office. And they basically offered me the job, like, right then and there. Again, my ultimate dream was to be a fighter pilot, but I'm not going to say no to a flying job. All right. So I grabbed the C-130 job. I said, I'll do it. Sweet. And off we went. They sent me to uh, undergraduate pilot training to fly C-130s. I flew the T-37, the T-1 at Columbus. 
While I was in the T-37, I met a girl in Fresno, California. I was dating her for a while. She was in the master's program. I, I don't remember if she was at school or she was at work, but I was just kind of hanging out in her apartment. I just heard jet noise fly over. Now, you've been in the military long enough. Immediately, I'm like, that's an F-16. I had no idea there was even a guard base in Fresno. So I jumped in the car, and I just went to the airport, and I just started driving the perimeter of the airport until I found the gate to the guard base. These guys don't know me from Adam. I have a lot of good friends in Fresno still to this day. I, I love these guys for this. They just treated me, you know, as well as anybody could be treated. And they were super kind to me. In fact, they brought me out to the flight line. They showed me one of the jets. They're kind of like, well, you're flying the T-37, so your ejection seat qualifies to let me sit in the seat. Right, it was amazing. And then after I spent a couple of days there, they offered me a job. They no kidding were like, "Hey, you're still in the tweet. If you want to come fly F-16s, we can make that happen." Now, dude, let me tell you, I wanted to say yes so bad. I, I can't even tell you how much I wanted to say yes to these guys, right? And what I told them, I said, hey, I, I really want to do this more than anything. But the Maxwell guys took a 29-year-old dude off the street, and I really feel like I owe them something. And I don't want to bail on those guys. And I said, if you'll allow me a few years, pay back those guys what I owe them for the flying. If the offer's still on the table, I will absolutely come back here and come fly with you guys. They said, hey, we respect your decision. And I think they meant it. So off I went. I flew the T-1. Get ready to go fly. The C-130, I get back to my home unit. Shorter version of this already crazily long story is the C-130s were having a lot of wing spar issues. So the C-130 training at Little Rock was super backed up. So I was casual for, you know, eight or nine months there waiting for a school date. I finally got a school date. I was still a brand new lieutenant. So I was a lieutenant. We had another lieutenant who showed up a few months after me. And then a few months after that, we had a captain that, you know, my C-130 squadron hired. And they decided that they were... When I got my class date, they were decided they were going to have that captain skip the two lieutenants and send him in my spot, which was very disappointing, especially after being there for nine months. But uh, at that point, I was kind of like, okay, I've kind of shared my loyalty with this unit, but I feel like now it's okay for me to kind of start looking around. So of course I start calling the Fresno guys and start, and start calling other units. Maybe a week after that happened, we had a guy just show up at the squadron one day, flight suit, he's a you know, butter bar lieutenant, no wings. And so all the curious little monkey lieutenants, right? We go scurrying over there, like, hey, what's your deal? Short version is he was a Danley Field guy who got picked up by Danley to fly F-16s, didn't get fighter qualified for, I don't know the reason, but he didn't get fighter qualified. So he had to find a heavy unit to pick him up. So he went to Maxwell to fly the 130s and he's still doing, he's still there. He's crushing it. He's doing really good stuff over there. Right. And so as soon as I heard that, you know, we were like, yeah, forget those fighter guys. They, they're young. Like nobody likes those dudes. It'll be so much better over here. I got my car and I drove straight over here, talked to the OG and I said, hey, here's my resume. Here's my grade book. Here's my flight commander's phone number. Sounds like there's an opening because I met him. He's a nice guy, but I want to fly your jets. Just so happens his name is uh, Lou Drumheller, Beast Drumheller. I owe everything to that guy. As it happens, Beast played football at Auburn. So he kind of felt like there were some skill sets that came from the game of football that translated very well into being a fighter pilot, which looking back 20 some years later now, I agree with that. I understand where those parallels are. And so he appreciated that. So he kind of said, you know, we'll look into it, hang out, kind of meet the guys. We'll decide. Fast forward a little bit. They decided they would offer me the job, right? So, like, hey, we'll take you. But we don't even know how this works or what we're supposed to do or how to make this happen. But in true fighter pilot fashion, I had already, I spent the three weeks doing all of that research, right? So as soon as he said that, I had all the answers ready for him. I was like, here's what we got to do. Here's the waivers that we need. The people have to sign, whatever, yada, yada, yada. So got all that done. They actually sent me back to undergraduate pilot training. So in the Air Force, the way it works, when I started flying was that it was called Specialized Undergraduate Pilot Training, SUPT. So the specialized means they had two different tracks for the secondary track, right? So back in the NOM, back before me, everybody flew the tweet, then everybody flew 238, and then you went to do whatever. Once they went specialized, fighter bomber track was T-38, and then tanker transport track was the T-1, T-44 for the C-130s, and then, you know, some helicopter stuff for the rotor room guys. So the time the Air Force went specialized, I think there were six dudes before me who had gone from a heavy to a fighter. All six of those guys all did a TX in the T-38, got completely crushed in the T-38, got completely crushed at IFF. All of them have said they should have never even made it through IFF, but they kind of got through because of their situation. So I worked with Guard Bureau. I was able to get a waiver to go to fixed wing qualification advance Air Force Base so that I could get almost a full T-38 course. So I went back to Vance. I went to UPT twice. I don't recommend it. <laughs> There's a lot easier ways to get to a fighter, any airplane for that matter, than spending four years in AATC. Just don't do it. Trust me. So I went back to Vance, flew the T-38, and then I went to IFF and kind of all the normal, you know, F-16B course and normal pathways from there. So not, uh, 
many, if any, have really kind of walked that path. Again, I don't recommend it. The guys before me that did that conversion all had at least a thousand hours in their airframe. And I had literally done it with nothing but some T1 time. So don't do that for all you kids out there. There's better ways. It's hard to look back and kind of be, at least I find with myself to kind of be honest about some things you maybe idealize things or maybe not the other way around, but is there anything you would have done differently to get to that end state? Or are you glad that that's the path that you ended up walking? Man, whatever that pathway was, got me to where I am, right? It got me to be the dude that I am right now. So honestly, I probably wouldn't change that because I don't know who I'd be or where I'd be. The example I give people all the time is if I had gone to the academy and I had gone to pilot training out of the academy, there's no way I'd be flying fighters right now. I just lacked the maturity to do that at that time in my life. So the fact that I didn't get to doing this until I was 29, almost 30 years old, I think made a big difference because it gave me enough time to mature, to be at the point in life where I could actually do this successfully. But like I said, you know, I basically had three opportunities to go do this. And finally on the third one, I was like, okay, I'll actually listen and go fly fighters. And here I am 21 years later, right now I'm the deputy OG here at the 100 fire squadron. And uh, I guess technically it's the 187th operations group, but same guard squadron for 21 years. And honestly, there's no place I'd rather be. You mentioned the B course and that's where you learn your, we call it uh, the basic course, basic course. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's where you're going to get that first look at an F-16. Was it Luke for you? I guess? It was Luke Air Force Base. Okay. Three. Knife, QQMF, okay. for those who know. I don't, so I'll, I'll take your word for it. Uh, what was that first flight like in the airplane? So, kind of terrible. <laughs> For whatever reason, when I went through the B course, the first flight in the F-16 was, they call it a 50 cent ride. It was like in the back seat. You didn't get the ride in the front seat. So like, it was- Traditionally, it's a dollar ride, right? So I'm guessing that's the joke is, yeah. Right. So- <laughs> Half the experience if that. So your first time in the front seat's a dollar ride and you decorate the dollar bill for your IP and all that. But the 50 cent ride, so, you know, I like, like, finally get to fly the F-16. It's like, sweet, now get in the back and be a trunk monkey and all that kind of stuff. So um, it was mostly just instrument flying, things like that. So it wasn't super exciting, but the second ride when I actually got to in the front seat was was great. I was filled with awe, you know, just the fact that somebody would actually trust me enough, even though I had an IP sitting in the back seat watching everything I did, just to have the, the trust to fly, you know, a multi-million dollar piece of equipment was pretty amazing. What was the B course experience like in general? My B course experience was amazing. My B course had a great, great group of guys, first and foremost. You talk to any retired guy in the Air Force, usually the first thing they'll talk about is all the people they flew with, right? So just had a great class, a lot of guys I'm still really good friends with to this day. And then I had a great group of instructor pilots, many of which I'm actually still friends with to this day, right? So just kind of that initial stage of flying was really amazing. I just feel really lucky to have gotten to be in the class that I was in and gotten to fly with the IPs that I flew with. One of my instructor pilots was actually Trojan Gilbert, which most people in military circles know, um, who, you know, passed away in Afghanistan um, into strafing. But he was, you know, one of my IPs initially in the 309th. So when I think about, you know, my flying career, I was introduced to the dangers of this profession very early on. It was really kind of a good lesson. Juicy Jefferson, who's a, a two-star general now, one of the guys who's one of the best IPs I've ever flown with, hands down. He was an Alabama guard guy for a long time. He said something that I, that I always share with dudes. When you're flying a fighter, you're never more than 15 seconds away from abject disaster. It's 100% true. So that's something that I, I learned early on in my career and something I try to keep with me even to this day in my career and in my flying. Just remember that it's a dangerous business. And I've at this point, I've lost a lot of friends flying. You know, it's just a reminder that freedom is not free and it comes at a very heavy cost sometimes. And, you know, there's many who've come before me and those will be after. And we try to learn the lessons from those ahead of us so that we don't repeat some of those mistakes. Especially in the training commands, we have a saying that, you know, training rules are written in blood and it's very true. So mistakes that other people made, we learn from those so that we don't repeat them and lose more personnel, more aircraft, things like that. It becomes but, very personal. And in some ways, it's probably a, a bad thing. And in other ways, I think it's an incredibly good thing because it keeps you honest. I don't think I've talked about it thus far on the podcast, but I have three photos of three friends that I carry with me in my wallet. They fly with me every day. It's, it's tough. You know, I don't know a better way to say it than that. It is, yeah. you, you want to honor them. You don't want to make that same mistake yourself, but also remembering they didn't mean to as well. They were doing their absolute best, everything that they could possibly do. And just sometimes it is, it is not your day, but uh, you want to take care of the family and those that are left behind, but you also want to you know, take care of their memory. And I remember the good times. I remember the smiles and the laughs and all that as yeah, well. So that's right. It's a, it's a balance, but kind of putting us in time and space. We're talking about okay. early 2000s, right? What block model of the jet? What, I don't have to say exactly what radar, but <laughs> yeah. what engine? I, I want to, what did you learn oh, on? Man. What was that first initial touch point in the F-16? Now you're really testing me. So it, <laughs> it's it was, not a test, uh, I promise. It was, a, it was block 25. I believe it was SKU 
5.1, which was the avionics package, the software package. We didn't have like color monitors. They were still green and black. I think we had GE engines, like the GE 100s. It says Pratt & Whitty on the motor. It better say Martin Baker on the seat. Is that a, <laughs> still, I know on the Navy side, that might be a joke. But. Yeah, there's some truth to the Pratt & Wimpy engines for sure. <laughs> but uh, I say this is a Pratt & Whitney family, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> That's where my folks worked. So I've flown both Pratt's and GE's over my career. I've, I've flown every block of F-16, including the Block 60, by the way. That's probably another story, but... Uh, Did not know that. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll have to get back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, why, I guess I didn't fly the Block 15, so that's not totally true. But third, everything 25 plus. I'm pretty sure we had GE engines back then, but there was no J Hemix or helmet mounted display or anything like that. We did have saddle, but it wasn't very good. We had lantern pods, <laughs> which were terrible. Large and heavy, I believe, too. Yeah, they were definitely heavy and couldn't see much with them anyway. And then uh, I don't know how the night vision goggles were classified, but we had, you know, green and black, old school NVGs. Anvis uh, 9, well. probably. Yeah, yeah, Anvis 9. Okay. I'm pretty sure. But that's basically what we had. It was still a Mexican radar. I don't want to get this wrong, but maybe APG-68 or whatever radar. So What's uh, it like learning to run a radar like that? You've already got so much going on in that airplane. I mean, the F-16 was originally a day fighter. A lot of people think forget that. Yeah. And and so you had a lot just flying the airplane itself, and now you have to learn and operate that radar. Was that a pretty intuitive thing? Was it something you can learn? I don't know. Is there even a sim for that? How, how does that process work? There are simulators. Uh, so we would do quite a few sims. So every phase of flight, you would go do that phase in the simulator. It's, it's really good for the blocking and tackling. So the big thing with the F-16 Mexican radar is the elevation control. So there's an elevation knob. And the thing that got messed up all the time was people were looking at the wrong elevation, right? So you kind of have a slice of pie coming out of the front of the airplane and you have to move that wedge of pie either up or down depending on where the adversaries are so that the radar is looking in the right piece of sky. That was the thing that got messed up more than anything in that jet. And so it was, it was always an issue, but that was the biggest challenge with the radar. The other challenge, it was just, you know, it was still pretty old. We didn't have, at the time, there was no multi-target track or anything like that, or even dual target track. So you could really target one target out there. We had a track wall scan mode, which would kind of allow you to maybe target two, sort of, but there was a lot of rules about being able to, to shoot off of that. And it was, it was kind of messy. So most guys didn't use it. And so that's why it's so important, as I understand it, to sort the picture. You have different airplanes, different radars, looking at different things because you have one guy can't see it all or get it all, I suppose. A hundred percent. I'm butchering something, by the way, that you love, because I'm not. No, no, that, yeah, you're, you're nailing it. So we walk out the door and we have like a radar sort plan. So we have certain guys looking high, certain guys looking low, so we can get as much coverage as we can. Obviously, we have hopefully AWACS or GCI or somebody helping us out with the picture. And then when we get a targeting responsibility, if it's outside your area of responsibility, your AOR, then you might have to roll your L strobe up or down. Or, you know, we'd have a thing like if your flight lead was targeted to something in the high AOR, then you would have to automatically roll down to the low AOR because we only had so much radar coverage. Very different than the F-35. I'm sure it is <laughs> incredibly is, we different. We see everything. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, it's probably yeah. much nicer, yeah. So I, I do remember having issues with the L-strobe control like every young guy does. This might be a silly perspective. Do you think, when I say legacy, don't get offended, please. No, no. Do you think being good at the legacy stuff, at that, that tech, makes you maybe appreciate an AESA radar more or be better at running it? Or is it really just like the kids, the kids these days? They just have the magic and they can run with it and they don't need that appreciation that you have. Well, it certainly gives you appreciation. When you fly a platform, for 16, 17 years, whatever it was, with not tons of SA, and then you go to a platform with an order of magnitude more SA, it's uh, it's amazing. It's, it's kind of scary <laughs> in some regards. So the way our military operation area is set up is we have, you know, chunks of airspace that we use, but they have these weird angles cut off to them. And all those weird angles are for the arrivals going into Atlanta, into Hartsfield-Jackson. And so in the F-16, I would just go out there and fight the best I could with the radar and the SA that I had. Every once in a while, we'd have an air airliner that would fly over the top of the MOA that would kind of mess up the picture for what we were fighting. And it was always fun to watch your buddy like lock up the airliner when you're the, the adversary, right? And you need to sneak in and just go pop them in the back of the head because they're looking at the wrong thing. But uh, usually it wasn't a factor. Like very rarely did I even know that there was an airliner out there. Or we'd get a stranger traffic call from Atlanta Center saying, hey, there's some guy in his Cessna 172 Heavy that's trundling through the middle of the MOA. So we'd have to, you know, avoid that area or whatever. But that was kind of it. So you didn't really know all the things that are out there trying to kill you. And now the F-35, I can see everything that's out there trying to kill me, right? So I was flying yesterday. We were just kind of between sets and I was just looking at the line of airlines going off those weird diagonals that we have set up that I've just never seen before flying here because I didn't have the SA displayed to me in the F-16 that I have in the F-35. It's just this train of airliners. I'm like, man, there are airplanes everywhere out here. Never had a clue. Is it something that you can get sucked in to that system and you're so heads down, so to speak, that it almost takes away from your SA? The only reason I mentioned that, the poor man's analogy sitting over here with uh, yeah. Stratus receiver and four 
flight right <laughs> is that I've had so many pilots say, man, I didn't realize all that traffic was out there. And I was like, yeah, okay, I get that. But also you need to be heads out looking for it. I always, you know, brief visual scan is going to be primary. Secondary is going to be any kind of electronic aid. Right. I don't fly behind a radar that is way better than, for example, ADS-B. But is it something you can kind of get sucked into the, uh, the scope and you're spending a lot of energy there when you maybe you need to be outside? Or is it something you teach folks to have that balance? Again, I'm kind of old school, but I am a big proponent for looking outside. I think, especially as a fighter community, we don't do that enough. And truthfully, the new generation of pilots that go straight to fifth gen, they call themselves purebloods for some reason. Really? I've heard yeah. fifth gen babies. I've not heard purebloods. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they call themselves <laughs> pure bloods. We call them fish and <laughs> Okay, fair enough. It's I like HUD like babies, right? Like, or whatever. But, or HUD um, cripples on our side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. So, jury is kind of still out on where they are SA wise, but with the HMD and the F 35, it's pretty nice because I can put tracks in my shoot list and look outside and see them through the HMD. So, that kind of helps as well. HMD being the helmet. The right? helmet mounted display. Okay, so it's all where your head looks, that's where the, the information is. Well, some of it. Okay. F5 designated it. So, but wow. so if I go, hey, I want to look at this guy, and then I designate him and I look outside, Side, I'll see him in the HMD, which also did the same thing in the F-16, right? So it's, that part's not really that new. But the difference is I can see all the other dudes out there and not just the one guy that I'm looking at. Like I, I could see in the F-16. So I've always been a big proponent of looking outside. And as a former instructor in the F-16, just a wingman now in the F-35, right? But I would teach guys that a lot. And the story I would always use, this is one of my kind of go-to combat stories for looking outside. But in uh, 2014, we were in Afghanistan and I was flying with a young lieutenant, brand new lieutenant at the time, who's now our F-35 weapons officer, so he's crushing it. And we were doing armed overwatch. So in 2014, the big drawdown was happening, right? So I was in Afghanistan in 2011 for the big surge, and it was mayhem. And then 2014, it was the drawdown. So when we got to Afghanistan in 2014, I can't even tell you how many cops, fobs, bases, all that kind of stuff, they're out there, they're everywhere. But when we left, there were four. So we had retrograded the entire war down to four bases. So there was a lot of convoy overwatch. So uh, me and my wingman were assigned to convoy overwatch one night, and we're doing what we call yo-yo operations, which really stands for you're on your own. So what we would do is one pilot would stay over the convoy, overwatching the convoy. The other pilot would go get gas by themselves and then come back to the AO, and then the second pilot would go get gas. Depending on what was going on on the ground would kind of determine who I would send to the tanker first. So this particular night, I elected to go to the tanker first. I left my wingman over the AO with the convoy. I go get my gas, probably takes 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how close the tankers are. I get back to the AO and uh, I'm getting ready to take the AO from my wingman so that he can go get gas. And he kind of keys the mic with this really nervous tone. He's like, uh, one, two on ox. <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, what's up? He's like, yeah, um, I, I kind of lost the convoy. I was like, what do you mean you lost the convoy? He's like, well, I was tracking him in the targeting pod. And the targeting pod is basically like looking through a soda straw. It's like I was tracking him and I was dropping flags and something happened and I lost my targeting truck pack and, and I can't find the convoy. So I was like, well, hey, dude, just look over the rail. You see that giant line of lights and the pitch black desert? That's the convoy. I got it. You're clear off to the tanker. So if he had just looked over the rail, that's it's literally the only thing you could see in the pitch black of night in Afghanistan where there's like no cultural lighting whatsoever. So that's just a really good indication of like, hey, man, sometimes if you just look outside, yeah, I mean, your essay bubble just enhances greatly. Talk about looking outside. I'm yeah. told, uh, and switching topics wildly here, so hopefully Let's that's Let's do okay. it. I love it. Talking about flying the jet in the weather. I'm told the F-16 is a spatial D nightmare. You're sitting up high. you got that bubble canopy. I'm told, again, never, never hadn't had the privilege, but I'm told it feels like you're sitting on the end of the jet. And then flying that airplane in the weather where your head's down, head's up. I'm told it's a bit of a challenge. I was wondering maybe if you could kind of talk about flying the airplane in the weather. Or maybe so it's right, super been, easy and everyone's no, just no, no. lying to me. So. I've been asked a lot of questions <laughs> about flying F-16s, never about flying in the weather. It's actually a really interesting question. But um, I think it's, for me personally, I wouldn't say it's any more of a spatial D monster than the other airplane I've flown. I think as long as you have a good instrument cross check, you don't rely on the heads up display too much. I think you can do pretty good. The times that I've had a little bit of spatial D in the F-16, I think probably what happened in an airplane was usually on the wing of the tanker for long periods of time. So the, the trip that stands out to me specifically was the 2000 nine Iraq deployment, we were replaced by someone. I think it was Atlantic City. I can't remember who, but some other unit showed up to replace us from the AO and we were all going home. But we had a broken airplane, so we never leave one, so we left two. And I was kind of the young single guy, didn't have anything going on. And so uh, they needed a couple dudes to stay behind to bring the broke jet home once they got it fixed. So me and another guy stayed back while everyone else flew home. You know, I flew for another two, three weeks, just guest helping with the guys who were there. It wasn't a big deal. And finally the jets were ready to take home. So so the good news, it was just me and another pilot, so two jets with a tanker. So we just had one 
one dedicated tanker getting us all the way home, which was awesome. Never happens, right? So it was great. However, comma, it was bad weather. <laughs> I think it was, I want to say it was like October, November, 2009, North Atlantic. And we were just socked in, in the weather for hours three or four hours on the boom, just, you know, looking right at the tanker. It was brutal. And there was definitely some, some spatial D that started happening because, you know, I'm flying straight ahead, but I'm looking to the right for, again, literally hours at a time. And, you know, my neck was sore and it was just, it was just not fun. Made me never want to cross the pond again, to be honest. But And not to ask about tactics is I'm told these days with radar, you just lock them up and maybe go into a half mile, mile trail. Is that not a thing? Do you not want to lose sight of them because it's that ocean crossing and you have to keep them visually in contact? They have all our gas and the the weather was so thick. The problem is when you, you can go back to radar contact, you can do those things, but then there's some visual requirements that you have to have before rejoining on the tanker. If it's just kind of light, wispy clouds or kind of milk bully, no problem. You can do that. But when it's really heavy weather, if you get back there, you may never find them again. It's obviously a problem when you're in the North Atlantic in a single seat fighter, right? That makes perfect sense. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So the one thing that we did was every, I don't know, every so often, uh, it was Fatty Jones was my flight lead, but uh, every so often me and Fatty would just kind of swap sides of the airplane. So I would go from the right wing to the left wing just to give your neck and your shoulder just a break. And I, I remember usually actually getting on the boom is like the worst part of that trip because that's when you're working really hard. And, and I just couldn't wait to get on the boom. I was like, I just want to get on the boom just so I can just look straight for, you know, like 10 minutes, <laughs> just give my neck a break. But it was brutal. It was not a fun trip. How long was that sortie in, in duration? The first leg we flew from, see, this is Iraq. I think we went, I can't remember if we went to IUD the first day or if we just went straight from Iraq to Marone. But either way, we ended up in Marone on that trip. And then the weather flight we we're talking about was from Marone to back to Montgomery, which was probably 11-ish hours. How do you do that in a single seat fighter? That's insane. A lot of piddle packs, a lot of snacks. Yeah, piddle packs and snacks. And I usually, I'll take an iPod and put one of the earbuds in my ear and just kind of listen to music or the podcasts weren't really a thing back then. But I would, today I'd probably listen to a podcast or, or something like that. But, you know, when you have a whole cell, like six jets, you know, doing a pond crossing, which is pretty typical, you know, we'll just have conversations on the aux radio. We'll tell jokes, do trivia sometimes, you know, just whatever, just to make the time pass. So. Spain to Montgomery. That's incredible. The worst flight ever was actually, I flew an F-16, so it was a D model, the two-seater, which is a little bit shrunken cockpit. It then had a CDU, the center display, which is basically like an iPad that sits in the middle, which takes a couple more inches of room away from you. It was the middle of winter. I think it was like October, November, something like that. So I had a poopy suit on, survival vest, all that stuff. I flew from Brussels, Belgium to Tucson, Arizona. And I volunteered to do this for some idiotic reason. So I, I've spent a lot of time training in Tucson, got a lot of good bros there. And they're like, hey, man, we got this good deal. We got a short version was most of the F-16 maintenance, had big heavy maintenance is done at Hill Air Force Base. And Hill was really backed up. The European F-16 maintenance depots in Brussels. So Tucson, it wasn't even just Tucson. So we had three Tucson jets, a Buckley jet and a Kelly jet. So there were five of us that went over there to Brussels, picked up the jets and flew them home. And then as we kind of got to the right places, guys just kind of peeled off and went to their home bases, right? But I'm wearing a poopy suit. It's choking the life out of me, right? I have these big red marks around my neck. 16 and a half hour sortie. Brutal, brutal sortie. Somewhere over Chicago, I'm just staring at the ejection handle. Like if I punch out, I can say whatever I want to say happened. Nobody will ever know. Like I was just staring at that yellow handle, man, because I was just ready to get out of the airplane. We finally got the jets on the ground in, in Tucson. They had to pour us out of the cockpits. Like we were just, all three of us were just wrecked. It was brutal. On a non poopy suit day, what's the family model like? The two seat jet, what's that like flying? Is it really that different from the single seat airplane? So ours were very different. So when I first started flying the F-16, it had all steam gauges, right? I told you I had monochrome deals, all that. Well, as the SKUs kind of advanced, we got better and better technology. Eventually we got the CDU, which replaced all the steam gauges in every airplane with the exception of the D model. We didn't put in the D model. So going back to fly a D model, I was always kind of like, uh, I don't remember how, like, how to fly the steam gauges again, because I just hadn't seen them in so long. You know, we fly the D model on occasion, but it's not not usually the primary airplane. It's usually the one we cable all first. We pull parts off it to make other airplanes flyable and things like that. Until we go TDY, then all the crew chiefs want to get their incentive rides. And then that's like the best flying airplane you've ever seen, right? Like the best maintenance ever goes into the D model on a TY because they just want to keep it flying. Most of my D model flying has been incentive rides, which is actually a lot of fun to take someone up on their one and only F-16 ride and kind of do some stuff. So any good stories from those flights? Um, we don't, we don't have to use of, names, I promise. Mostly just a lot of vomiting and... <laughs> 
please stop, please stop kind of stuff. But I've learned the best way to make someone throw up, and I, for clarity, don't do it purposely, is the aileron rolls. For something, oh, maybe, yeah. maybe I just have poor technique, and I don't have that, I don't even know what the roll rate is per second in the Viper. It's but crazy. Yeah, uh, you, you can get folks sick quickly. Loops usually aren't going to do it, but aileron rolls will absolutely get you there. What I found, I've done more than rise length count, to be honest, but a lot of people would just, you get in the airplane, you do the unrestricted climb, you level off, and they puke, right? Like, just new environment, weird smells and noises, and it, they would just throw up. Then I would get probably the second highest percentage when we start doing like some baby acro, right? Some loops or some barrel rolls or aileron rolls, that kind of stuff. That'll get to people. The thing that I found gets people the most sick more than anything else is actually flying low. Like when you drop down on the deck and you're you're doing 500 knots, it's just like tree, tree, cow, tree, house. Like people's brains just aren't processing information that fast and it just... It, it just makes them throw up. I don't know what it is. Sorry, I keep snapping. No, no, you're good. <laughs> Do you have a favorite incentive ride? Maybe someone you look back on, like you could tell, not mm. only, I'm guessing y'all, like you said, fly a lot of crew chiefs, folks that have worked incredibly hard. Yeah. If, they should be at the top of the list, hopefully, those flights. But they usually are. Anyone that y'all remember, or you remember in specific, that was like, man, this was, this was an awesome experience for me and them. Probably my f- Oh, there's so many. We can do more than one. I always just like no, to start no. off. With yeah, one. yeah. That's actually a good question. So I think the one that really just immediately comes to mind, my last crew chief on the F-16, the crew chiefs don't own the jets. The pilot don't own the jets. They just let us borrow them from time to time if they're feeling very generous and nice and let us go fly them. So we were in Yuma doing MOT support for the Marine Weapons School, and we brought a D model. And like I said, when you're TDY, the D model is a flying machine. So we, I think we flew it three times a day with incentive rides. My crew chief was a young lady named Bailey, and I got to fly her instead of ride. So we jumped in the D model and we went and flew a low level around Arizona, flew over the dead, well, I don't know, whatever. We flew the low Salton level. Sea. Salton Sea. Yeah. yeah flew yeah. over the Salton By Sea. Central, yep. And then you got the big mountain on the other side. There's a low level that kind of wraps around the Moas there and the restricted area. And so went up over the mountain, back down the other side, all kinds of stuff. Went and beat up the pattern. It was super fun. Getting to fly with the crew chief on my jet. That's the only time I've ever actually done that, strangely. And, you know, did two or three patterns directly over the ramp over Yuma. So all their, because the Marines don't care, right? There's no rules. Especially down there, uh, yeah. the couple, I got a ride at El Centro and a ride at Miramar, only two Super Hornet rides. And first off, it looks just like the movie. When people talk about Top Gun and the low-level scenes they did in the movie, yeah, because it's that similar part of California, it's just like the movie. I don't know if it's true, so that's why I'll tell the story. I'm told, at least at El Centro, there's not a big controlling radar. And so when we came into the break, the Australian, uh, sorry, the foreign pilot that was flying me uh, <laughs> lit the burner in the break. And so the, the Super Hornet, apparently you break twice, once for kind of spacing, and then a second time, right. there are car alarms going off, I'm told. I mean, like, oh, yeah. if you do it right, you're fine. Miramar, absolutely not. You're not going to do that kind of an overhead entry because, you know, people and stuff. But that's... Uh, that's fine. I've actually flown out of Miramar and El Centro, believe it or not. No way. And the Viper. Yeah. El Centro guys were amazing. Yes. In fact, it was the same Yuma trip. So there's two parallel runways at Yuma. So we were doing this big fight. We were supporting the MOTS. We were like either strikers for their weapon school or like Red Air, the adversary for them. We're on our way back and one of the contract Red Air airplanes, I, I don't remember what kind of airplane it was. It wasn't an F1. It was, it was like an, even older than that. But he has a gear emergency. So he declares emergency. They put him on the right runway. He lands on the right runway. The left gear collapses, and he slides off the right runway across the infield onto the left runway. He shuts down both the runways just as the the, the big fight is everybody's RTB from the big war. So shuts down the airfield. We immediately all start scrambling to go somewhere different. So a bunch of us ended up in El Centro, and it was the craziest thing I've ever seen because we've got F-35s. We've got F-18 Super Hornets. We've got F-18 Legacy Hornets. We've got these goofy Alabama guard guys in their F-16s, right? And we all just show up at El Centro out of nowhere at like seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. The sun's already down, it's dark. And all of a sudden these Marines come out of nowhere. They have these hot pits set up. Like we don't even have maps of the airfield. So they're giving us progressive taxi. They're like, hold over there. They just set up this whole queue. They start running airplanes in and out of the hot pits, gassing us, right? So when you do hot pits, there's a lot of procedures to it. There's checklists, there's signals. These guys don't know our procedures. I don't know theirs. I don't know their signals. We're just kind of doing pointy talky charades. I'm pretty sure it's the flight lead. Oh, perfect. So if something goes yeah. wrong, it's just all on it's you. It's all on you me. Know, no yeah. big deal. <laughs> So I'm trying to like pointy talky, like how much gas I need. And they immediately just start trying to put gas in the jet. But I have all these things that I have to do to prep the jet first, right? So I'm trying to get them to stop. I'm running through the checklist real quick. And somehow they gassed up all these different airplanes, all running, all showed up unannounced out of nowhere. 
it, I'm talking there's probably 15 jets and got us all out of there and back to Yuma in time for dinner and drinks at the bar. It was amazing. So whoever you dudes are out there at El Centro, you guys are rock stars, man. If you ever want a guard job, call me, dude. I'll hook you up because you guys were rock stars and thank you for what you guys did because I promise you that wouldn't happen in the Air Force. That's awesome to hear. Well, you mentioned MOTS and WTI. What was the interaction with y'all? Were y'all guest players, like you said? I'm just curious how an Air Force Air National Guard unit is part of that giant evolution that the Marines yeah. do to certify their, their weapons and tactics, guys. So we were guest players. It all came about, our director of operations at the time was a prior Marine F-35, MOTS grad. His bro network is kind of how that happened. So we showed up out there and we were just support. So it was kind of whatever they needed for their training. So like I said, there were some sorties we'd fly where we'd be adversaries. There were some sorties we'd fly where we'd be strikers. So they would have their F-18s or, or their uh, F-35s that were escorting us to the target area and back. We did some where it was more of a defensive counter air scenario where we were both defending the target, had different lanes or different times to defend the lane, things like that. So it was kind of a smattering of everything. And then a bunch of time to go fly low levels. They gave us a bunch of live weapons because there's tons of ranges around Yuma. In fact, it was the only incentive ride also at Yuma, same trip, the only incentive ride that I've ever flown where I had incentive ride in the backseat and released live ordnance. <laughs> It was great, man. He was a Marine captain. I think he, he was either a maintenance guy or an ammo guy. Like an ammo weapons type, I think, is what he was. So when we threw him in the back, we went out, we dropped a GBU-12 laser-guided bomb. Then we shot a Maverick. Then we did a bunch of high-angle strafe. It was great. All in one flight. All in one flight. It was unbelievable. I hope that person realizes how incredibly, I, incredibly lucky they were. He probably doesn't, but we... <laughs> And since it's the D model, we had all the rules set up where we could have GoPros. So we got the whole thing GoPro. It was amazing. GoPro 360. Even better. Oh, Get the whole thing. That's dude, awesome. It was awesome. Uh, when we did low safe, so we were supporting VFA 106 at El Centro. The end of that evolution for them, they're, you know, dry passes. This is, you know, with the baby F-18 students, right? So dry passes, and then they shoot the gun, you know, going on the range, drop in blue death, a couple of which I may or may not have in my hangar in Tennessee. Nice. Uh, yeah, allegedly, you know, not, you can't prove it, uh, except for photos. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a long hike onto the range is all I'm saying. Saying. But at the end of that, that was the 500 pounders, you know, dropping those on the range. And we had some, they, I'd say, we, I'm not part of 106, we were supporting them. Yeah. They had some midshipmen that had come down from the Naval Academy there for the summer. And it's like, well, boss, there's two seat jets. And they put them in the back of the two seat jets and they went along on some of those live, obviously with IPs, right? Because there's the IP and the yeah, lead jet. And yeah. Then, yeah. So they're not going to put them with a student. Of course, we're flying the T6, which is what we're there to do, happy to do it. But there were a <laughs> couple empty seats and it always happened to go to the midi. I was like, oh, good. So happy for you, but also you do not realize how awesome an experience that is. Yeah. And they all, of course, they all loved it. So they do. And you know, those, those guys work really hard. They're out there long hours, bad weather, right? Rain, shine. Yeah, for clarity, the maintainers, not the midshipmen. They don't work hard. Well, yeah. But, yeah. I don't know anything about midshipmen. I'm not a Navy no. guy. But <laughs> our maintainers for sure. Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. Absolutely. So and uh, they should be we at always the front joke, of the list. Yeah. Like the flight line is the hottest place on the earth and it's the coldest place on the earth, right? Like if it's cold outside, it's really cold on the fly line. If it's hot outside, it's really hot out there. And they're always out there doing a lot of good work for us. And, you know, I always say it takes a high school education to fix what a college education broke, right? Incredibly but, true. Uh, we couldn't do our job without those dudes. And Heck I, yeah. I love those guys. One of the beauties of flying an aircraft that can fit 55 people in the back is taking, in some cases, lots of people up. And it's always kind of funny, especially some of the uh, admin types or, you know, the, some of the maintainers don't really, they're around the aircraft, but not in flight. And the yeah. looks and the smiles, and it's, it's, it's awesome. It doesn't get much better than that. So, so speaking of incentive rides. Oh, boy. Here and speaking of Yuma, uh -huh. I almost forgot probably my most epic incentive ride. Okay, well, let's hear about it. It was definitely my most stressful incentive ride. So when I flew a jet out to Yuma and I was scheduled to commercial home, because, you know, we have more pilots than airplanes, so, you know, we kind of take her. So I flew a jet out, and when the rest of the wing showed up, all of our maintainers and support staff, they all showed up, it was in a charter from the airline that I work for. So I immediately go, oh, I guess we have this charter. I did my time in Yuma. I went back, you know, a couple weeks before the exercise ended. I may or may not have brought a couple of handles of um, alcohol up to our charter schedulers. Oh, like, allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> That's how the world can't works, prove it, team. Can't prove it. <laughs> no, you, no, we cannot. I, I was just like, hey, these are all my guys. This is my unit. Like, it would be amazing if I could somehow get scheduled to fly this charter on the way home. So they did some of their magic. I don't want to get too much of the details, but they were able to work out a way where I was, I could pick up that trip. So to tell you how amazing just being in the, the military in the guard is, I was an, a first officer at the time and the captain who got assigned to the trip had a daughter who was at the Air Force Academy. So he actually let me fly in my, you know, 100th fighter squadron, you know, civilian stuff like polo and all that kind of stuff. And I had the entire wing in the back of the 767 flew in from Yuma to Montgomery. That was the most high stress landing that I have ever had in my life because I knew if I prank
banged one in, I would never, ever hear the end of that. So. And we haven't heard the end of it. You did great, apparently. And, so <laughs> it, it wasn't my best landing, but it was pretty good. It was good enough. And it was like strong crosswinds, whatever. It worked out. So I, I basically got to give the entire wing and send a ride all at once, which was, was nice. And you brought him home, too. That's something that has to be appreciated. One of the few joys of being at the ship in the helicopters when you're bringing them something. Yeah. They're always happy to see you. In that case, you're bringing them home. They're probably happy to see Even if you pranked it in, they're still going to be happy to see you. <laughs> yeah, they're going to make fun was, of you, but they're going to be happy to see I you. Think, I think everyone thought it was pretty cool that they actually got to fly, you know, one of the wing pilots have him bring him home. So the full circle piece, not that that part of the ride wasn't amazing because it was, but the captain had a daughter who was at the Air Force Academy and she was interested in getting, to, you know, into flying and all that. So when it came time for when they go out and do their visits, we gave her an instant ride in the F-16 and her, her dad came out and got to see it and all that kind of stuff. So what are the odds, right? But this is the kind of thing that you could probably make happen in the guard that you can't usually make happen in the active duty. So it was, it was a really good trip. I guess the Yuma trip was amazing. It sounds like it. From the sound of this podcast. I was going to say, yeah, no one has ever described Yuma as amazing. So no. I'm glad we're... <laughs> That's the all. flying was amazing. The, yeah, generally when things are described as the flying is amazing, everything else is usually terrible. Yeah. But, so talking about flying, getting back to flying, flying. Um, what's the primary mission set of the F-16, or was the primary mission set here in Montgomery? The F-16 is a multi-role fighter, right? So what I usually tell people is we do every mission in the Air Force short of hauling trash and passing gas. So uh, we did not have the suppression of enemy air defense mission, the seed mission here in Montgomery, but we had all the rest. We had offensive counter air, defensive counter air, close air support. I was actually a Ford air controller airborne, so we had FAC A on the dock statement as well. I was one of five that we had. The beauty of the F-16, like the F-15 guys, they are rock stars at air to air. That's all they do, and they're amazing at it. You know, same thing with the Raptor guys and all that. The A-10 guys, they do Sandy and Cast, and they're amazing at those things, right? They're the ace of the base when it comes to that stuff. The beauty of the F-16 is we get to kind of do everything. So we kind of get to be the jack of all trades, master of none, if you will. But I think there's a certain mastery at kind of being good at everything, which is not something that, you know, every platform has to deal with. So for me personally my and, and my personality, I think just the opportunity to fly multi-role, which transitions straight into the F-35 as well, which is awesome. Just kind of get to do all the missions is really fun and it's really challenging because I'll get really good at, I don't know, BFM and then we'll go to air combat maneuvering and I'll get pretty good at that. And then we'll do tactical intercepts and then we'll go do surface attack tactics and OCA, offensive counter air defensive counter air then we'll get into close air support i'll go do a bunch of fac a stuff we'll go drop a bunch of bombs support dudes on the ground and then we go back to bfm and i'm like man how do we even set up these fights again because i haven't flown a bfm sortie in five months you know so it's constantly a challenge you're constantly kind of studying getting back in the books stay on your game and for me that that part's pretty fun kind of getting to go out and do different things and not just have it be super routine is for me personally pretty enjoyable so i think the multi-role lifestyle is one that just kind of fits me and my personality i'm really glad that i end up as a multi Guy. Fact A, did you just raise your hand? Or was there, there was a demand, I'm guessing, hey, we need to send someone to the school or the training or uh, how, how that process No, it was it was almost the opposite. Like I had to beg, borrow, and steal to get sent to Fact A school because there's just not a lot of slots. Where's the school itself? So at the time it was at Luke in the 310th. FAC Ford Air Controller A Airborne. Ford Air Controller Airborne, yeah. yeah. In Vietnam age, we're talking about, I mean, there were FACs in like Cessnas. Yes, and there was fast right. FACs in F-100s. Now that two-seat jets, now that generation has kind of passed in the Air Force as I understand it now. It's single-seat guys doing the Ford Air Controller mission. The Strike Eagle would probably be an amazing Ford Air Controller platform, but they don't do it. The F-16 and the A-10 pretty much have that mission. The F-35 can do FAC A. In fact, one of my big goals in life before I you know ultimately retire is to try to bring FAC A into the F-35 community. Now that the JMO has changed, my FAC-A qual is actually good in the F-35. So as long as I can keep it current, I can keep doing that, which is awesome. For me personally, you know, FAC-A is probably my favorite thing to do in the Viper. So I, I really want to kind of keep that mission alive in the F-35 and I'll keep pushing and pushing until they tell me no. We said but favorite mission. Why is that? I think it's it's not the most challenging mission that we do, but it's the most challenging mission that we do with regard to how rewarding it is. It's super challenging and super rewarding at the same time. There's probably other things that are more challenging, like BFM is super challenging to be really good at right but i've got five combat deployments all to the middle east all doing close air support so we like to go out and kind of thump our chest and be the best bfm on the base but at the end of the day it was time to do the mission we were doing close air support getting to be a ford air controller is getting to be you know the expert the pro from dover on close air support so when we would have our young wingmen and our flight leads and our eye puggies would go through their training when they get to their cast phase most of them would be scheduled to fly cast with me so that we could really you know because i was kind of the 
the expert in close air support in the squadron, if you will. So that was kind of my role here. So, you know, they'd fly BFM with the weapons officers and things like that, the guys who are really good at dissecting BFM. I'm terrible. I can't draw to save my life, right? Those dudes are great at it. Uh, so There's no chalk around here either, so I don't know how you guys do no it. No chalk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> dry, it's all dry erase now. It's, now I use magnets in the F-35, which is great, because I don't have to draw anything. But uh, on my 2011 deployment, I was the JTAC liaison, so I would go out to all the cops and fobs and debrief sorties and... So I got to spend a lot of time outside the wire with those guys and got attacked PQOL eventually and, and kind of went out and did some of that stuff. So I had three, two or three cast deployments before I ever spent any time on the ground. And so for me, going as that JTAC liaison and spending time on the ground with those guys really changed what cast was to me. It just became something, you know, looking at piles of rocks in the tarny pod all of a sudden became a lot more important when it's a big overwatch position on whatever objective we're going after, right? And so that's what really motivated me to get into the FAC A world and go out to, again, Yuma, strangely, to get my TAC-P qual and all that kind of stuff. So, What was your favorite asset to work when you were a FAC A? A-10s. But mostly because it's up close personal. Keeping track of Vipers is tough, or even Strike Eagles, is even as big as they are, kind of keeping track of them sometimes is really difficult. B-1s are easy because they're massive, but they fly weird patterns. But just working with the A-10s, just seeing the gun up close personal is pretty cool. Or just being on the ground when like a 2,000 pound goes off from a Strike Eagle or something like that, it's, it's pretty amazing. I think the reason I like controlling a 10 so much is like I said, they're pretty easy to keep track of from the ground, which is nice. But the thing that people don't realize, because everyone knows about the A-10 and the massive cannon on the front end and all that kind of stuff, right? But the thing that no one realizes when the A-10 rolls in and they hammer down on the pickle button, the first thing that happens is you see white smoke from the barrel. And then the second thing that happens is all the rounds go off. Everything around there just gets turned into mush. And then the last thing that happens is the famous burp sound that everybody talks about, right? Such an iconic sound that's what everybody talks about, but usually all the work is done by the time you actually hear the rounds go off. And for me, that was always like, I don't know why I like that so much, but I always thought it was just really cool, you know, how that worked, just seeing that happen. But uh, it sounds like sacrilege saying that. That's why I was a little surprised. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But it's just, I mean, it's just the honest answer, man. They were just much easier to control than other platforms because they're just so easy to track. Totally fair. Talking about your airplane itself, what I'm trying to go to kind of through the menu of ordnance that flies on the F-16 and then what you've employed. So I'm guessing the gun you talked about, strafe. Uh, so high angle strafe and low angle strafe or just high angle? So combat wise, I've only done high angle. The problem with low angle strafe is it can get you pretty close to the ground when you do that. So in a combat environment, may not want to be 75 feet above the dudes that you just strafed, right? So Iraq wasn't as big a deal, but in Afghanistan and Syria, there's uh, some terrain that can be a factor as well. So elevations in Afghanistan are massive. All the numbers change. Because if you fly sea level numbers at 9,000 or 10,000 feet, you're going to smack a mountain. So you have to open fire earlier, you have to cease fire earlier, you have to start your safe escape earlier because the air is thinner, you don't get the same performance out of the airplane. So there's a lot of factors that go into that, which can kind of make it challenging and fun sometimes, but um, definitely had a good time. Whenever you get to roll in and and shoot the gun, the ground is great, but high angle strafe was, if you had a choice, now low angle strafe is much more accurate because you, I mean, you get down in the weeds and you get in there, but I'll take the safety of of some distance if you don't mind. Low angle strafe, I'm guessing anyone with a BB gun is, you know, you're now in their effective range as well, theoretically, if they can track you and put something up. Oh yeah. And uh, uh, what year is that? 20, I think 2014, we were there with the A-10s, all on the same base. Like our ramps were right next to each other. And those guys were always coming back with like 7.62, you know, little divots in the bottom of the airplanes, things like that. We never had that. We we're just too fast. You'd have to pull so much lead. Now I've got plenty of turning pod footage of dudes shooting AK rounds at us, but never got close. <laughs> you know, yeah, I can imagine. It yeah. yeah. Uh, rockets, uh, you mentioned the Maverick. LMAV? So I've shot the, how was that, the K? The old school keyhole Maverick, and I've shot the LMAV. Okay. Um, what's that experience like? I've never shot the Maverick in combat. Okay, fair. Well, even in training, yeah, I, in training. I, I haven't shot either of them. So what's it like? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's a big ass missile, especially coming off an F 16, right? Yeah, I don't know. It's. You don't seem as impressed as I am, so. I'm really trying to be impressed by it. I don't know. <laughs> That's totally so fair. The thing that happens is usually, especially when you're releasing live ordnance, whether it's combat or just in training, usually the only thing going through your brain is don't screw this up, don't screw this up, don't screw this up. It's usually you're just so focused on it that it's not as fun as you would probably think it would be. I don't want to hurt anybody that I don't mean to hurt, but I will say I've dropped you know, a bunch of 500 pound dumb bombs, 2000 pound dumb bombs, obviously all different kinds of rockets, you know, the white FOSS, flechette rockets, just the regular HE rockets, Maverick, only in training, the gun, obviously, GB-54s. I've never shot an air to air missile in hate. Well, yeah, we, we'd know yes. more about you if you had. I have shot air to air missiles in training though. 
which is pretty cool. So Dr I, drone, I'm guessing, or flares? Shooting a drone. So I got to shoot an AIM-9 at a drone out over the water. Now, <laughs> I was the first guy to shoot. There's windows that you have to shoot in because the idea is to recover the drone. If you shoot at the right aspect at the right time, the right ranges, and then the drone has a bunch of flares and they can kind of break the missile apart before it impacts, things like that. So you kind of, and then they'll look at the telemetry and go, yeah, this would have been a hit or a kill or, you know, because most of the time the missiles don't actually hit the airplane. They just get close enough for the proximity fuse to trigger, to detonate, throws a bunch of frag through the airplane. That's what takes it apart, right? And so I was shooting an AIM-9, not even like an AIM-9X, but like an AIM-9 mic. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like the Lima mic AIM-9, but at the subscale drone and I clipped the wing. So I was supposed to shoot the first day and there was some sort of issue and I didn't get to shoot. So they put me first in line the second day. So I was the first guy to shoot and there were, I think there were five or six other guys waiting for their turn to shoot. And I shot the drone down, took the wing off and went spiraling into the Gulf. And that was it. Everybody was done. So everyone got to bring their aim lines home, but I got to shoot mine. Kill's so, a kill, right? <laughs> kill's a kill. So, the, you know, of course, the entire group now, we have one aim nine shot that we get to look at. So my shot gets broken all the way down, but everything was in parameters. So it was good. Strangely, and I'm not even kidding, probably a year and a half later, that same drone washed up on the beach in Mobile, Alabama. And I don't know how we got to that thing, but we got to that drone and uh, we wanted to keep it. The test guys wouldn't let us keep it. So they made us give it back, but they let us keep some parts on them. They're still over there in the heritage room. So nice. yeah, I was part of a couple 120, AIM 120 shots that we shot at full scale F4s. So can't talk a ton about those shots, but I did get to shoot the 120 a couple of times. APKWS at all? So I've shot some APKWS. And this Which, is essentially, a, we're talking about a Zuni rocket with a with a laser laser on the yeah. front end to make it super accurate. So we, we call it AGR-20 now, but it's like APKWS. So the thing about it is it's very accurate. You actually lose quite a bit of range shooting it that way. Here's a fun story about shooting rockets. So in, um, this was the 2011 deployment. I was pre-Advon, so I went over there early. I was flying with the Triple Nickel. I got a quick Block 40 check out with the Triple Nickel guys that went and flew in combat. It was pretty cool. But So the way we were employing at the time was flight leads were carrying rocket pods. So when you're in the desert, you're fighting in the rocks, it's really hard to find enemy fighting positions, right? Like we probably don't give the Taliban, the Kanye work, all those guys we were fighting over there enough credit, but they're really smart. And they were familiar with our tactics, just like we were with theirs, right? And they did things that made it hard for us to find them sometimes. And so when guys are in close combat and, you know, their buddies are getting shot up, they need weapons out there now. And you don't have to drop a bomb on the bad guys to make them stop shooting, right? Sometimes just a bomb in the general area is enough so guys can break contact or, or get out of there. So what we found was it would be tough sometimes for us to find the enemy that we were going after. And so we would kind of use heavy bombs, like 500 pounders, as suppression weapons to suppress enemy fires, but also to kind of locate where they, where they were, right? So we would drop a bomb about where we thought the bad guys were based on all the talk we were getting. And then it'd be a big boom. The guys are still shooting. You know, maybe the JTAC that we're talking to, is, it'll say, okay, from that weapon, go 100 meters west and 30 meters down the mountain or up the mountain, whatever the case may be. So they would kind of use that to kind of talk us into where the enemy fighting positions were, the EFPs were. And so what we found was it was a little bit more... It was faster and it was a little bit better use of resources because a lot of those kits are very expensive. And in 2011, the surge was going on and we were just dropping tons of weapons where we got to the point that we were concerned we were going to run out of tail kits and things like that. They just weren't making them fast enough. And so what the rockets let us do was kind of let us be more precise, get close to where that EFP was. So I would go, here's a suppression rocket. Here's where I think they are. And they're like, hey, move that rocket over here. Okay, here's where I think they are. Sweet, that's where they are. Okay, to give me a 500 pounder on that last rocket, right? So we would do stuff like that, and it was pretty effective. But uh, <laughs> the laws of armed combat were so ridiculous that the best way I can shoot that rocket is in a mode called CCRP, continuously computed release point, right? So I basically designate something on the ground. I go, I want my rocket to go there. And then I just line everything up. I hold the pickle button down. And then when the jet goes, okay, if I let this rocket go right now, it will go exactly where you want it. I give it consent and the airplane decides when it's time to release. And we would just shack whatever it was we were shooting at. It was just as accurate as the AGR-20s, the APKWS was super accurate. So why can't you do that? What's the problem with that, right? Well, when you shoot it, a rocket in CCRP mode, it becomes, it's no longer direct fire. It's no different than dropping a JDAM. So when I shoot the rocket in CCIP, which is continuously computed impact point, 
it's a direct fire weapon. If I shoot it in the CCRP mode, it's indirect. And when you shoot it in the indirect mode, now you have to have danger close numbers and you have to have collateral damage numbers and all these things that go into that, which make it like a big mess. Cause we're like, well, what's the collateral damage estimate on a rocket? Well, it's a really small warhead, doesn't do a lot of damage, but if you miss or if a fin goes bad, it can go a long way in the wrong direction. So ultimately we're looking at this and the attorneys were basically like, don't shoot them in CCRP. Don't shoot them at the way that they're complete nail drivers. You kind of have to aim with the sights of your pistols and use that method of CCIP to actually put the rocks down. So we couldn't shoot them as accurately as we are capable of because of the laws of armed conflict, but it was good enough to get the job done. So it got us where we needed to be. But yeah, you know, shooting rockets CCIP is probably the most fun weapon to employ. Like just raging around, just shooting bottle rockets out of the front of your airplane. That was probably the most fun weapon to employ, even though it's probably the least lethal thing <laughs> I've ever flown with in combat, but uh, it was definitely the most fun. You mentioned five different deployments, right? So yeah. that first combat deployment, did you employ at any point? I had one employment on that first one. It was very, things were really slowing. This was Iraq, things were really slowing down and there were very few few drops on that deployment. It was really weird. But, the, uh, the only reason I asked yeah. the question is, was that something, was that a full circle moment? You've done all this training, we've been skipping around throughout the career, and that's, that's totally yeah, fine. But sorry. No, 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 not at all. This has been awesome. <laughs> but was that something that you kind of thought, I've done all this training, I've worked incredibly hard for a long time, this has been my boyhood dream, literally, and I finally did the thing. I protected someone on the ground using my aircraft, or was it kind of like you said, it just it became a more a routine thing because you've been training so hard for it's just It's just another flight, except this one, you actually happened to put ordnance on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, it was, for me, I would say it was definitely anticlimactic. And again, when you're in training, dropping inert ordnance or live or just heavy pieces of concrete off the airplane that you know can hurt somebody if you screw it up, it's very nerve wracking. When you're doing it in combat, it's 10 times as nerve wracking because you know that if you mess it up, like literally good guys will die, right? Like Americans and our NATO allies, you could literally kill people. It's happened a lot in combat. So I think ultimately, it was relatively uneventful for me. And the fact that I was like, okay, I'm glad I did that. I've been sitting on the sidelines, like practicing for however long. And I finally got to get in the big game and, and do the mission. But ultimately I was just happy that I did my job right and didn't screw it up, you know, to be perfectly honest. The same guy I told you a story about earlier about looking outside at the convoy. I was his flight lead for his first ever combat drop. And for me, that was actually much more memorable than my own first combat drop. Why was that? I don't know, just when these guys get back to us and gals, but when the, these pilots come back to us from their pilot training, they have the, just the very basic knowledge of understanding. In fact, like if they come back to us from Luke or wherever they go to pilot training and they show up in the squadron and if we deploy the next day, we're not bringing them with us. We put them through about a six to nine month training program called mission qualification training. And so they have to get through mission qual training before we'll even deploy with them. For Lefty, it was, he had just finished MQT and we brought him on the deployment because you kind of get to see these guys learn and grow over decades. And so, like I said, he's our F-35 weapons officer now, and I was his flight lead for his first ever combat drop, right? So I've really seen his progression over the years. And now, you know, I was teaching him how to be a fighter pilot. And now he's, today we debrief for like four hours about all this stuff that I did wrong in the F-35. And now he's making me a better F-35 pilot, just like I got to make him a better F-16 pilot back in the day, right? So you talk full circle. I mean, that's about as full circle as it gets, but it's really cool to kind of see these young guys grow up and see them progress. And that sortie in particular, along with being his first combat drop, was just it was just a crazy day or actually night turn to day so most of our combat missions were around four to five hours depending on what you're doing personally i prefer to fly at night for two reasons one nighttime is usually when the professionals are out so you get to work with like you know all the snake eaters and like the real professional dudes on the ground which is super nice and two and more importantly all the bobs work during the day you, you want to be my bobs right like all the bosses they all work during the day so in the squadron, we could play Halo and play loud music and just play dominoes or whatever. Like you can do all kinds of crazy stuff and nobody cares because there's no adult leadership around to, to yell at you. But during the day, you know, you can't do that stuff. So, and a lot of guys don't like to fly at night, especially places like Afghanistan, right? It's super scary and a lot of big mountains out there and big rocks that'll kill you. But I've just always gravitated towards the night train. So anyway, so we basically had finished up our vol and we were about to head home for the night when we got re-rolled to a Troops in Contact, which is, I'd probably say less than five percent of my combat drops actually happen on the JTAR, which is Joint Terminal Air Request, on the actual mission that I was supporting. 
it's always, hey, you're supporting this mission, but these dudes are getting shot at, so get over there and help them, right? That's probably 100% of my combat jobs, to be honest. So we get rerolled to this tick right at the end of our vol. We end up working this tick for probably another two or three hours. So the thing that really stands out was I was just a night guy, so I had NVGs and all that kind of thing. What I didn't have was my visor. So now the sun's rising. It's low on the horizon. I have no dark visor. I have no sunglasses. And the sun is melting my eyeballs. Now, you know, it's basically the end of the day for me. I've been flying all night. You know, I'm tired. I'm fatigued. I'm hungry. I'm probably dehydrated. The sun's melting my face. And then we had terrible communications. So we're working with some guys on the ground and they can't hear us. We can't hear them. They're getting engaged from caves. Some, you know, bad guys are shooting them from a cave. And it's just a big mess. So ultimately, I think I dropped down to like 5,000 feet above the good guys. And I'm just flying circles over those guys. And basically, I'm radio relaying up to my wingman. So I have, I dropped down low so I can actually talk to those dudes, start figuring out what's going on on the ground, get set up. I basically, I'm talking to my wingman on the other radio. You know, I'm like, go here, get set up for this attack. Finally figured out what the dudes on the ground needed. Talked my wingman onto it. I can't remember. I think he dropped and I laser designated, but honestly, I don't even remember. But we end up employing, you know, two drops. We hit this cave full of bad guys. The whole cave collapses. It was nuts. But all the fighting stops. So hooray, right? And ultimately, we go home and call a day because we're completely wrecked. But it stands out because of all the goofy stuff that happened. It stands out because so literally the first thing I did when I got back to the, the hooch that night was I got on Amazon and I bought a pair of sunglasses and had Amazon ship them to me over in the desert so that the next time that happened, I just threw a pair of sunglasses in my pocket. So if I ever got re-rolled to the day, I still have those crappy aviators that I keep in my juicy pocket just in case I find myself somewhere where, where I need them. So. And that was the Iraq deployment or Afghanistan? That was Afghanistan 2014. So two Iraq, two Afghanistan, one Syria? Yes. Okay. So yep. rolling back, you talked about Iraq first. What was, is there a story, a sortie maybe that you could think of that kind of defined the Iraq experience? Or it can be more than one, but three different theaters, similar, but not the same. I was hoping maybe you yeah. kind of maybe phrase it that way or talk about it that way. So Northern Iraq is beautiful. It's kind of got this red clay kind of feel. There's this massive reservoir by Mosul. It's like deep blue water on this kind of red clay background. Northern Iraq and Iran, that kind of area, there's a lot of like really big mountains in the backdrop. It's actually super pretty up there. When you get to central and southern Iraq, it's just beige desert with the exception of the Tigris and the Euphrates, right? So you can be anywhere and you look out and you go, oh, hey, there's a bunch of green stuff and there's some more green stuff. So I guess that's the Tigris and that's the Euphrates and everything else is just desert. The big battles and stuff that most people know from Iraq war, like I didn't really take part of me of those things. Most of the stuff that I did was just kind of onesie twosie stuff here or there. My most memorable Iraq sortie, a buddy of mine from my B course was in the squadron that was replacing us. So when all the new guys show up, we do their local area orientation, their LAOs. So we give them LAOs. We basically kind of, it's a combat sortie. The jets are loaded with stuff, but then you, you take off and you're like, okay, here's this region. Here's that region. A lot of stuff happens there. Nothing happens there. Here's where the border is. So don't fly into Iran or whatever, right? Faso and I are scheduled to go fly FATSO's LEO. So my deployment's about done. I'm on the way out. His deployment's just starting. We had a really nasty storm roll through, actually for several days. And when we finally got the fly, there was still pretty bad weather, but they decided to go ahead and send us up. So FATSO and I took off. We were the only two airplanes airborne in all of Iraq. And we had no mission. It was basically, we just went airborne to get his LAO so they could take over the theater and we could all go home. He and I are just alone and unafraid, just two dumb young captains, right? And we have the entire theater of Iraq all to ourselves. And nothing happened. There was no, you know, no combat, no fight or anything like that. But it was probably the most memorable story I had just because almost never are you the only thing flying over an entire country. So we got to do that that day. It was pretty cool, but not super exciting. Not a lot of bomb drop or anything like that, but probably the most memorable sortie other than the, the flight home, that tanker and the weather for hours. <laughs> okay. So from so those guys, thanks a lot for that. <laughs> I mean, that. they got your home. So I suppose that's the, yeah, that's okay. the, the important part Let's of it. Go with that. <laughs> uh, okay. So from Iraq to Afghanistan, again, two deployments on the Afghan side employed a lot more over there, right? I think there's actually a pretty good video. Was that the 2014 yeah. deployment? That, that was they did 2014. The video? Okay, yeah. cool. What was that environment? What was that AOR like? The thing that I guess was really super memorable for me about that deployment, really both 11 and 14 is, you know, the first thing is just we talked about earlier the number of bases that were there when we started the number that there when we left was was crazy it went from hundreds to four that includes like the outposts and the the cops and the fobs and all that stuff the other thing that really stands out to me is i remember we 
employed so much. There was just tons of fighting. Sometimes I get my years mixed up, so I can't remember which years were what, but like I remember, was it Fob or Cop? I think it was Cop. Cop Marga almost got overrun. We were airborne that night and like dropped all of our ordnance. There was another... Um, when you say all your ordnance, you're talking bombs, rockets, the gun, everything? Everything, everything. So you went Winchester? We went fully Winchester. Is that a common occurrence? No, it's pretty rare. I went Winchester one night, that was over Marga, and I went what we call Remington, which is everything but the gun, and that was one night. I wanted, I think it was Fob Salerno. Technically, it was overrun because guys got on base, but um, airborne that night. But it, dude, there was just tons of fighting, and we just dropped so many bombs as a squadron. And then I remember coming home from that deployment and turning on the news, and it was nothing. It was like it didn't even, it wasn't even happening like it didn't exist because by that time, it was just so much fatigue. But I remember being so up not really appalled, but just, I don't know, amazed, flummoxed. I don't know. Just, just I, I couldn't believe that we had just done so much fighting, right? Saw a lot of guys die, lost several Americans that we were protecting, right? Which is a really hard thing to go through. But we just went through this crazy experience. A lot of it's outlined in the video that you're talking about. You can see all that. And then we get back home and it's it's like it's not even, it's like it's not even happening. And for me, that was just, it was just kind of a really weird feeling to just come home to the fact that no one even, you know, was paying attention to that theory more, realized how much stuff was actually happening there. So that juxtaposition was was really one that kind of stands out to me really from all those combat deployments. Because even when we came back from the whole ISIS thing in Iraq and Syria, that was still in the news. Everyone, you know, kind of knew what was going on. We got there right after the big Mosul fight, tail end of the rocket fight, and then, you know, all the stuff going on in the Merv and the tri-border and all that. We were part of a lot of that stuff. So making up new tactics in that fight, there was like a lot of stuff that never been really done before <laughs> or trained to that we were doing. So is there an example? Obviously, yeah. speaking broadly, but is there yeah. an example we can talk about? The best example I can give you is we had people in places down there that we were defending. So the, what we would call the defensive counter air mission. So usually if I'm protecting the quickie mart, I'm usually several tens of miles, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, 80 miles out front of the quickie mart so that I can get rid of all this stuff that might try to hurt the quickie mart before it actually gets to the quickie mart, right? So like if you're defending your house, you want to be between the bad guys in your house. We started doing defensive counter air carrying 2,000 pounds of bombs, so four or 500 pound bombs. And we were flying like 20, 30, 40 miles sometimes behind the point that we were defending. So you're protecting the bad guys from getting in your front door, but you're standing in your backyard. <laughs> That's basically what we were doing. What drove the tactical change? I think what really drove it was they still needed us there to do the close air support work that we were doing. But in the Merv, the way it was set up, the Middle Euphrates River Valley Merv, sorry. But the way the Merv fight was happening was on the west side of the Merv. There were, you know, Russian helicopters going up and down there. There were Russian fighters flying around. Like, I never thought I would ever see a Su-35 up close in person let alone seeing it in the air, let alone seeing it so much that it was just routine, like, oh, there's another Su-35 or whatever, right? So the stuff that we were really kind of flying over was right up to those lines, and we couldn't go out in front of it because now we'd be flying over where the Russians and the Syrians and their kind of designated area to fly. So we had to do all that from behind the point that we were trying to protect and do it with bombs on the airplane, which was crazy. And we always got to do it for an extra hour and a half because the Raptors always showed up late when they were replacing us. So thanks, Raptor bros, for never showing up to the cap on time. How hard is it? <laughs> be on time. Timeliness is, you know, it's an acquired skill. If it happens every once in a while, I do whatever. It was like, you could bet on it. Like, oh, well, the Raptors are ripping us out, so we're bring extra food, you're going to be there for another hour, right? So anyway, what we now lovingly refer to as legacy fifth gen. Ah, my yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there. yeah. So <laughs> the old stealth jets. Yeah, the old Not stealth. the old, old ones, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The quote, right? The one that I that I love, you know, I was only below the hard deck for a couple seconds, right? Yeah. Uh, or same thing when we'll have, uh, again, not the same world at all in the little, the mighty T6 of which I did my last flight in today. You know, when you exit the airspace just briefly, it's like, uh, you know what, guys, this is training. In the real world, there's literally combat fighters that are loaded up and would yeah. love for you to cross over to their side briefly, I'm guessing, to give them an excuse to do something. It, it matters, right? It absolutely it does matter, yeah. yeah. Those things matter. And that and that's why when you're in pilot training, you know, we harp on that stuff so much. And you're like, ah, whatever, it's just some silly line. But it could be a political border. It could be Syria or the Merv or Iraq or whatever. So but you mentioned 11 and 14, and my, my memory is failing me. Was 14 the beginning of ISIS in Iraq, or was it al Right, for, no. I keep saying Iraq, I apologize. I'm, we're skipping theaters here, right. bouncing around yeah, between. We're all over the place. Yeah, 2014. Did you know the folks that you were employing against? Was there that level of knowledge, I'm guessing, on the enemy? In 14? Yeah. yeah. You know, we knew if we were certain places, it was... ISIS wasn't a thing yet. It actually became a thing on that deployment. That's kind of another little war story. But we knew if it was, you know, Taliban, if it were a certain part of the country, or Haqqani Network, or if we were a certain part of the country, or, you know, other groups like that. So we usually have an idea of who is operating where. The only reason I asked the question is you talked about different 
different tactics, different techniques. With those different groups, could you tell from the, the eye in the sky that you are? Is that something that was transparent to you or is it your tactics are going to work either way because you've planned this out so darn well against any of these enemies? So from the close air support fixed wing mission, they didn't behave terribly differently than the other ones. So the way it works is we have what we call army glows, ground liaison Officer? officers, yeah. jello. They're always enlisted guys. I don't know how you call them glows, but they would show up. Before you fly, we would brief. And the first thing we would typically brief would be the glow brief. And they would stand up there and they'd say, okay, you guys are going here. Here's the army guys that are there. Here's their objective. Here's what they're trying to do. This is where they are. This is where they're going, whatever. So we kind of have an idea of the situation on the ground before we take off. Like I said, most of the point, you know, we would go get this great glow brief and know everything, not everything, but know a lot about who we were supporting, what they were doing. And then there'd be some troops in contact somewhere else. And we're scrambling just to get radio frequencies trying to figure out who the heck we're talking to that's basically how the situation works so we would have an idea of who it was what they were doing what their objectives were kind of who they were fighting sure is actually a good example of that because there was a lot going on there. So you had like the Syrian Defense Force, the SDF, the YGP, the whatever. And these guys are fighting each other. But when they fight ISIS, they're our friends. But when they fight Syria, we can't support them. They fight each other, blah, blah, blah. Right. It was like all this. It was just this mess of, you know, Russians flying around and Aussies flying around. And we had a tail flash tracker of everyone who was in theater. And there was probably like 30 different tail flashes of people who were flying out there. It was nuts. If I was going to write a book about the start of World War Three, it would be the MRF. But what I will say is when I did some of the ALO stuff was their knowledge of our tactics, techniques, procedures, TTP was super, super obvious. So the, the one thing I'll talk about, this is more actually rotary wing stuff, right? The fixed wing stuff, but we had the AWT attack weapons teams, which was the Apaches, and we had the SWT, which was the scout weapons team, which were the Kiowas. And the Kiowa dudes, I, I don't want to give away tactics here, but the Kiowas, they could load, you know, they loaded rockets they loaded 50 millimeter uh they had a 50 can uh, for, for 50 cal yeah, sorry not Kai 50 was gone. 50 cal. that's not even it's in gone. the inventory anymore so yeah, yeah something, i know yeah i mean those guys literally have grenades on the panel and they with doors off would drop grenades or fire their weapon out the door exactly insane Absolutely insane. So I actually did a couple of Kiowa rides with those dudes out of Fob Salerno. But that's a whole other story. But it goes to the attackers. So when we were out there fighting, whoever we were fighting in Afghanistan, when the Apaches would show up, everything stopped. Because the gunner in Apache, all he has to do is turn and look at you, and then you're toast. It's over. And the bad guys knew that. For the Taliban and all the guys in Afghanistan, shooting down a helicopter is like a winning lottery ticket, right? It means they get power, they get money, they get all this stuff. So the opportunity to shoot down a helicopter, they're always looking to do that. That's why the helicopters got so beat up in that theater. And when Apaches would fly over, nothing. They wouldn't make a peep because if they stand up and take one shot, the Apache's going to see him and it's going to be all over. But when the Kiowas would show up, they know that all their ordnance is forward facing. So if they saw the side of a Kiowa, the whole world would open up on those guys. We'd be over engagements and we're trying to figure out where the bad guys were. Sometimes the guys on the ground are trying to figure out their bad guys were. And the Kiowa would do is where they, they would just fly around. And then as soon as everybody opened up, started shooting at them, they were like, oh, hey, we found the bad guys. They're over here. And by the way, you know, I just got shot in the neck. So we're going to go land at the far. That literally happened. We're talking to a dude. He got shot in the neck. He went and landed, got a bunch of medical treatment. The next day he was out there flying combat sorties in his Kiowa, right? But they knew the TTP so well that they saw the sign of Apache. They wouldn't move. They saw the side of Kiowa. They would shoot everything they had at it, trying to get that lottery ticket. And so we found a lot of enemy by those guys just kind of doing what they're doing. But like you were saying, they knew the TTP so well. They knew the equipment so well. They're like, well, these guys can't shoot us. So they start shooting the M4 out the door and drop grenades out the side. They don't know that 556 when they're getting, it's coming from the helicopter. They just think it's coming from the ground guys. And I think they were probably more effective with the M4 out the door than they were with the two forward facing weapons because, you know, they knew the TTP. So, you know, know thy enemy is a real thing. And, and we do a lot of study on our adversaries and they do a lot of study on us and you know you can just see how that study comes out in combat and the things that the tactics that are are used in order to fight that you know the phrase danger close i'm not we don't need to talk about numbers but basically danger close when you're employing ordinance in that way that the people that you're supporting are potentially within the frag zone of your ordinance obviously you don't, yes. you, don't you don't intend to hurt them but you intend to hurt the enemy but by the same token they're that close the enemy is that close to them that phrase is going to be used have you ever employed danger close I haven't played Danger Close. It's nerve wracking because like I said, you don't want to do anything to hurt the good guys. And when you're going Danger Close, you're really close to the good guys. It's pretty interesting. We actually, so this is total fac A nerdery, but when we build our Danger Close numbers, it comes from what we call, I think it's 0.01 PI, which is 
0.01% probability of incapacitation. So this is like the percentage that if, uh, you know, that the lug nut in the bomb that's going to go way farther than everything else in the bomb, like hurts a good guy, right? So 0.1 PI was kind of the standard. So when we would calculate danger close numbers, we always did it from the uh, 0.1 PI prone, like laying on the ground, right? So it was 0.1 PI prone. So it was like, okay, if there's a guy laying on the ground, 0.1% chance that we hurt that guy with this weapon. Once you got outside that 0.1, anything inside of that distance would be considered danger close. Now the weapon and the fusing that you're using will change those numbers, right? So the danger close numbers for like a 20 millimeter from the cannon is very different than the danger close numbers from a 2000 pound dumb bomb, right? That can go anywhere. So the bigger the boom, the higher the danger close number. Or if you're doing an air burst by detonating a weapon above the surface of the earth instead of on it or even below it, those danger close numbers go out. So we would do things in combat to try to mitigate that. Like maybe I put a delay on the bomb so it doesn't air burst or impact burst, but maybe it goes into the ground and then blows up so it doesn't do as much damage. Or if I have, let's say I'm just going to make up numbers here. Let's say I have a danger close that's 200 meters. So I have guys that are inside 200 meters. Like, hey, you know, we're at 180 meters and we need this bomb. You're like, well, that's inside danger close. So you have to get ground commander's initials approval to drop that. And then you can just drop that weapon with ground commander initials. Or I could say, well, this thing has danger close numbers of 200 meters, but I have this other thing like the gun and the danger close number is smaller. And if I go to the gun or maybe a rocket or something like that, now I have a smaller danger close number where maybe it's only 120 meters. And now you're outside the danger close and I can go and play without using danger close numbers, right? So if there's ways to mitigate that, we would typically do that. My favorite story about danger close stuff is actually back a nerdery. But in 2014, we really started developing multi-weapon tactics and really in the F-16, but you know, A-10s were doing all that kind of stuff as well, where typically we were like, hey, here's some bad guys we need to bomb. Here's one bomb, right? The smartest dudes I've ever flown with was the weapons officer, the triple nickel at the time. And he's really the guy that created like a lot of these attacks where we'd start doing what we would call combo attacks or cocktail attacks, things like that but we would drop multiple weapons in one pass to get certain weapons effects. So what we found is if I roll in on a pass and say I'm gonna drop two weapons, right? So maybe I drop a instantaneous bomb that's gonna blow up and hits the ground, and then I drop an airburst weapon, right? So if I got a bunch of bad guys, like I always like to say a lot of gangsters doing gangster shit, right? And like, okay, these dudes gotta go. So I would roll in, the second bomb you drop is the first one to show up. So I would drop the airburst first, and then I would drive in and I would drop the instantaneous bomb second. The second bomb, shows up first, right? So the instantaneous bomb would hit, blow up. All the bad guys goes, oh no, the jets are here and they start running and here comes the airburst bomb to go off it would clean stuff up. So at the time, Danger Close was based on 0.1 PI of the guy on the ground prone, laying flat. What started happening was we out there supporting the Joes, doing our thing. The first bomb would go off and all the army guys jump up in the air. They go, heck yeah. And then the second bomb would goes off and now they're all standing, jumping up. So we actually had to take all the 0.1 PI prone numbers for Danger Close we had to push it out to 0.1 PI standing, which made the danger close numbers bigger because of just the human factors of the dudes on the ground. When you're getting shot at and you're like, dude, we're about to die and all of a sudden all that stops, you get pretty excited, right? So it's understandable that dudes would want to jump up and down and cheer, but it was throwing off all of our numbers. And so we had to change the whole danger close concept. So there you go. See, the stuff you learn in podcasts that you never even plan on talking about. I don't think I'll ever use that bit of information, but I've got it now. <laughs> so, right, yeah. and you know, you're ever on Jeopardy. I would have never thought that it's it's that dialed in, but it makes perfect sense. And you said a nerd, you know, data point or something like, that's why this stuff works or doesn't work. Little factors like that can make all the difference. And yeah, you don't want to be hurting the good guys either. So yeah, that's exactly. incredible. Yeah, I can imagine... I can't imagine. I've had ordnance come off a helicopter, 50 cal, you know, cruise serve weapons, and the uh, the bullets went somewhere over there. You know, uh, I think yeah. the most accurate gunner I had hit a seagull, which that's a story for another time. They they land on crates, and when you throw some crates out into the Arabian Gulf, all of a sudden these seagulls <laughs> show up, and it's like, I mean, the rounds have to go out of the aircraft at some point or another. So uh, RIP nice. to that seagull. But yeah, I mean, I'm just impressed we hit anything. But all that to say, right? Like, yeah, I'm well aware that something lethal is coming off the airplane. When you get so good at it, that has to be, I'm guessing, probably a really proud feeling. And then hopefully, like you said, when you're working with those maybe higher level tiered folks, they have the confidence in you that they know that I'm guessing not all F-16s are equal, not all F-16 units are equal. I'm guessing everyone has a reputation in the AOR. There's probably some people they want to work with more than others. And was that something yeah. you ever experienced that different entities, you know, that they know you can haul the mail, so they're going to call you first? A hundred percent. So there, there's some stuff in that heritage room behind you. I'll, I'll show you later, but especially when it comes to like the high tier professionals, they don't suffer fools. And so we all fly with the same call signs. If the call sign shows up and they're buffoons, then they'll never let them anywhere near their AO again. And if the call sign shows up and they do good work, then they'll ask 
for those guys in particular. So when you get into those high tier operations, those guys basically get whatever they want. I mean, they're obviously badasses. I've supported, you know, the special forces dudes on the ground and I'm in the stack and there's Apaches, there's A-10s, there's AC-130, there's Tornados, there's RF-16s, there's all kinds of like RPAs in the stack, remotely piloted aircraft, ISR platforms, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms, blah, blah, blah. Some civilian, some military, just a stack full of airplanes, right? I'm like, those guys get whatever they want. We can talk about the JTAR process and how a lot of stuff works if you want, but the bottom line is when those high tier operators make requests, it gets scored. It's actually very, very low, but the lowest number is the first priority in the JTAR request. So they all get scored like super low, like in the decimals where they always get the stuff that they ask for. So they're awesome dudes. I'm glad they're on our side, but when they need stuff, they get it. And when guys show up and they're not getting the job done, they will throw you out of the stack and you will never be invited back. So you know, it, it takes a lifetime to earn a reputation and just moments to destroy it, right? So the beauty of the Air National Guard, for its good and bad, is we have a lot of really experienced guys. You would have to go out of your way and intentionally work very hard to put together a four ship in our squadron that doesn't have an instructor pilot in it. Which is, on the active duty, you probably got three, I, you know, your squadron commander's an IP, your DO's an IP, and your weapons officer's an IP, and maybe an ADO, and that's probably it. Not a lot of IPs running around here. You know, most of these guys are like 2,000 hour instructor pilots. So we have a lot of experience. So when we go on deployments and things like that, we're interacting with other militaries and other, you know, whether they're U.S. militaries or foreign militaries or, you know, different guys on the ground, whatever. So far, knock on wood, but so far we've actually built a pretty good reputation for ourselves. But it's not that we're just like this great, great, you know, bunch of dudes or whatever. I mean, I think we are. But ultimately, really what it is, is just we just have a lot of experience. And even our young guys, when they are learning the airplane and they're going through their mission qual training, all that stuff, they're flying with really experienced guys. So they get really good training where their active duty counterparts, you know, they do their mission qual, they fly with IPs. And then their next sortie, they're flying with a flight lead who's six months ahead of them in the training who just finished their flight lead. And they're just kind of going and figuring it out. Where here, if you're a brand new guy, you're flying with really experienced guys a long time. So just the quality of debrief and the quality of sortie and the challenges and the lessons learned and things like that are just a little bit above par when it comes to our active duty counterparts, but it's only because of the experience level we have. Like I said, I've been here for 21 years and there's still three guys who've been here longer than I have. So I hope they never retire because I don't want to be the oldest guy here, but I'm getting close. We talked about that knowledge base. Uh, and one of the things I think the Guard definitely brings is that this unit in specific, or in particular, I guess I should say, is the heritage. And those beautiful yeah. red tails on the jets and uh, who knows, maybe there'll be a red tail on an F-35 one of these days, but there will be. I was trying to keep it secret. But, there will be. Uh, there will. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, but the reason I mention it is that legacy, that heritage is so important in the Guard. And I would say perhaps nowhere more than here. Do you feel that weight on you when you fly the airplane and when you work with the, you know, with outside entities that people know who you are and they know the heritage of this group? I don't necessarily feel the weight of our squadron on a day to day flying basis, but it is something I'm aware of. So most people are familiar with the Tusky Gearmen, the guys who went to combat in the P 47, the P 51. You guys all know the stories, but there were four squadrons. So it was a 332nd group. And the 332nd group was made up of four fighter squadrons. The 99th, they were pursuit squadrons at the time, but the 99th, the 100th, the 301st, and the 302nd. So those were the four Tuskegee Airmen squadrons. So we're the 100th fighter squadron. So we're direct Tuskegee lineage. Uh, we're right here in the state of Alabama, 40 miles from Tuskegee, which is where my scholarship program is, right? So for me, especially as a black aviator, I'm very aware of the weight that comes with wearing the same patch that the Tuskegee Airmen wore in World War II. It's something that I, I'm very very proud of. I feel very honored to be a part of, and I feel very responsible to try to carry that legacy forward, right? I don't want the Tusky Gearman to be a thing of the past. I want it to be something that continues to move forward throughout history and time. So I think that's part of the reason I started the scholarship program is to kind of help carry some of that heritage forward. That's why it's the Red Tail Scholarship Foundation and the Red Tail Flight Academy based on, you know, the legacy of the Tusky Gearman. The fact that we ended up at Tuskegee was almost a coincidence, but kind of worked out. Like I said, when I started in the squadron, we're actually the 160th. And I think it was September of 2007, we actually transitioned from the 160th to the 100th. So we brought the 100th back to the state of Alabama. And I got to be a part of that. I've met several original Tuskegee Airmen over my career. In fact, one of the reasons I'm flying fighters right now is an original Tuskegee Airman who was my neighbor. But during that ceremony, they basically assigned me to a gentleman named Walter Palmer. And he was an original Tuskegee Airman. Gosh, man, he must have been 87, 88 years old at the time. But I just got to spend three days just hanging out with him. And for me, going out and, and meeting 
someone like that is an amazing experience. Getting to spend three days with someone like that is a life altering experience, right? And so just getting to share stories and talk about what flying was like then, and as, as amazed and as honored and as proud as I was to get to spend time with Walter Palmer, he was just as amazed and just as honored to get to spend time with Lieutenant Peace, which sounds crazy, right? But he gets to, you know, it, it, he's passed on now, unfortunately, like most of those guys have, but he kind of got to see where his struggle, where his sacrifice, where his work kind of led to. He got to see the fruits of that in someone like me. And that that's something that I, that I remember. And I, I think that's why it's so, it's probably part of the reason I started the scholarship program, right? But I think it's so important to kind of get to see your legacy carried onward. And I'm glad that he got to see that when he saw that red tail F-16, I will never forget the smile on his face. Like he thought it was the most amazing thing, you know? And so having that experience, I think really impressed upon me of, of how important this heritage is and this legacy is and how much we have to protect it. And so on, you know, daily basis, when I'm out there doing my job, working, flying, I, I don't really think about it that much, but there are times where I kind of get to sit down and do things like this and really reflect on that legacy and that heritage, how important it is. And, you know, we're in the squadron right now, like you see red tail F-16s and soon i'm telling you you'll see some red tail f-35s but you know we have a picture on the wall behind you the alabama guard with the red tail p-51 and the reflection of an f-16 with red tail f-35s flying over the top right like this legacy is really important to who we are and it's something that that we believe in and we've been handed something very special and we're trying to be very good stewards of that and taking this legacy and this heritage and moving forward so every time we travel places we go down range whatever it is you know we're very aware of the fact that we're representing something much bigger than ourselves and i think that's important I thought I was a student in history. I thought I understood the heritage behind the red tail. And uh, not too long ago, a couple of days ago, when you were walking around the uh, the squadron, you asked me about that black tail flash on the jet. And I will be honest, <laughs> I have never. Tab, yeah. Yes, trim tab. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not the, the whole the whole tail is the yeah. Okay, the trim tab, the black trim tab. And I thought, yeah, you know, I've seen all the Alabama birds have it. I've never seen any other F-16s that have it. But I was hoping maybe you could kind of tell the story because I'm guessing if I didn't know, probably other folks don't know as well. So we mentioned the four squadrons and they all had big red tail, we'll say P-51s for the sake of this argument. You know, they flew several different airplanes, but all the, all the tails were painted red. We've all seen the movies, we get it. What people don't usually know about, especially about World War II combat, is when we have these big bombing missions with all the fighter escorts and all that, there would be hundreds of airplanes in the sky. You might have a mission where you have bombers coming from whatever base they were at. And you might have all four different squadrons flying in different roles of this mission at the same time. And as soon as the enemy shows up, it just became chaos, right? Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And so when the German fighters would show up, it would just become mayhem. And so the way you would recognize guys from your group would be the group markings on your airplane. So in this case, it would be the big red tail. The way you'd recognize pilots from your squadron would be the squadron markings inside the group markings on your airplane. So for the Tuskegee jets, the trim tabs were all painted different colors to represent the different squadrons. Now, if you're a couple miles away, you know, picking up an airplane out of the sun, you probably wouldn't notice that. But when you're rejoining on the wing, you kind of look at the trim tab and you can figure out, hey, is this someone from my squadron or is this someone from another squadron? Probably wouldn't matter if you're all going the same way. You're just happy to have a wingman again, right? So they would use those trim tabs to figure out who was who in the fight. So the 99th squadron, they either had all red tails with red trim tabs or they had red tails with white trim tabs. The 100th fighter squadron, which is our squadron, we have black trim tabs. The 301st had yellow trim tabs and the 302nd had blue trim tabs. So as uh, you know, Tuskegee Airmen Squadron, when we paint our tails red, we always put the black trim tabs on there to represent the 100th fighter squadron inside the red tail 332nd group legacy. So that's why we put the black trim tabs on there. Talking about the past, and I guess we'll kind of shift to the future. Uh, we talked a lot about the past, but one of the, I think maybe the most exciting things sitting, oh gosh, a couple hundred feet, maybe a little bit more uh, than, than that away from us is not just an F-35A, not just one assigned to this unit, but conceivably the best F-35A in the Air Force. And the reason I mention that, the, the jets that come off the line are the latest and greatest versions. And not that long ago, not only did this squadron take delivery of jets, you were part of that process. So getting trained up in the airplane, staying current in the airplane, and I'm guessing from Lockheed Martin, 
bringing those airplanes back to here. So I was hoping maybe you could talk about that story. Yeah. So I've flown the F-16 for a long time. I'm not great at it, but I'm pretty decent at it. And, you know, I'm kind of at the point where I've been doing it long enough and I know the mission well enough. I don't have to put tons of time into kind of getting back on step flying the F-16 just because I've done it for so long. Now I'm an old dog and the F-35 is a brand new trick. And not only is it a new trick, but the way we employ the airplane is very different, surprisingly different, to be honest. The pilot vehicle interface is very different. If you've ever seen the inside of an F-16, it's got to be 50 switches. Everything's a switch, a knob, a lever. So if you just look at the cockpit, there's just stuff everywhere. If you look in the cockpit of an F-35, I think I count them. I think there's like 14 switches total in the whole cockpit. Everything else is on the PCD, the big touchscreen that's the primary display in front of the airplane. We can take this big touch screen and we can break it out into, you know, a whole bunch of different little screens. And it's just a massive computer. And so for old guys like me, flying steam gauges, that kind of stuff, it's just what I know. For the fifth gen babies that are showing up, touch screens and, like, and the, all the really heavily computer stuff is right up their alley. That's all they've ever known their whole lives. So it's crazy. I watch these young lieutenants who've never flown any fighter before. And I'm sitting over their sh- shoulder in the, in the sim just trying to, you know, learn this airplane when I first started flying the F-35. And their fingers are moving a thousand miles an hour like i can't even keep track of all the button pushes that they're doing i still fat finger this jet all the time where i'm trying to get a zero and i get an eight instead or whatever right like just it's a very sensitive glass and i'm always messing it up so the way that this new generation of fighter pilot reacts to the f-35 and the way they just operate it it's very natural for them for me the pilot vehicle interface is a little bit frustrating to be honest because I just kind of want to go, I just want this thing to go there and do that. And if the F-16, I just got a point where I want and it goes. The F-35 is not that way. Like it, it's a little more, you really have to go slow to go fast. And you know, I'm just kind of a big dumb knuckle dragger. I just want to smash things and get it done. I just had to learn. I had to learn to slow down. I had to learn to be precise with my fingers and my button pushes and things like that. So it was just different. And like I said, the biggest challenge so far for me in the F-35, truthfully, is just getting from the chalks to the runway. Just getting all the computers to do what they're supposed to do and getting everything working. Once I can push the power up and just start rolling down the runway, it, it just kind of becomes a fighter. And, you know, the way we employ is very different than the way we do it in a fortune platform. But that's where my experience actually starts to show up for me, right? Like the situational awareness, kind of the 3D picture, the air sense, kind of knowing what to do if, you know, there's emergencies or things like that. That's more home for me and it's a little bit better. So the young guys definitely have a big systems advantage. They know stuff about this system, this airplane, I will never, ever know. I'll just never get there from here at this point in my career. So big advantage for the young generation on that. But I think as far as what you learn through experience and just trial and error and just air under your ass is something that can't be replaced. So, you know, it's like an old ad, right? But how long does it take to make a 10-year fighter pilot? 10 years. Having that experience really makes a big difference. So it, I think it helps me get good in the airplane in the air faster. Because not only do I have to learn a new airplane, I have to unlearn an old airplane, what we like to call around here fourth gen baggage, right? So I have to unlearn all the fortune baggage and relearn fifth gen stuff. What's the transition been like for, not just for you, but for the unit itself? Because I'm guessing we went, when did the last F-16 depart Montgomery? So we had our departure ceremony was April of 23. Honestly, not even that long ago. So April, April 23, the last, and I'm guessing it's not just, you know, other airplanes were going other places, so things probably quieted down. The facilities had to be, you know, kind of renovated. There's new things, that, wonderful things that have come in. We're sitting in an incredibly beautiful building here. I'm quite jealous as the Navy guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. While that's all going on, before airplanes can even show up, y'all are going to training and getting spooled up on the new airplane. So I was just hoping maybe you can talk through that process and maybe give right. us some of the wave tops. So we wave the so Navy wave tops. That's what I'm here so, for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our last F-16 sortie, we flew in April. I think my personal last sortie was in March right before that. And then all the jets were gone. The ramp has been empty between basically March minus the couple that we left here for the ceremony and until December when the new jets showed up. The problem is, you know, we have 30 some pilots in the squadron and you can't just send 36 guys out to train all at once, right? So it takes time to build guys. So what we initially did was a handful of guys actually left really early, like a couple years before the F-16 left. They kind of became our initial IP cadre. So they all converted the F-35 early. They got all their experience, right? So they became wingmen, they became flight leads, and they became instructor pilots. One went to weapons school. We had one guy, you know, go to safety school. He's our stand guy now, right? So we had a handful of young to kind of middle career guys who went out to learn the airplane early. So while we were still flying F-16s, they were out there being Panther dudes. And then eventually we got rid of our airplanes. That's about the time that I went to 
my transition training, my TX course at Luke. I went there, I had to unlearn F-16, learn F-35, didn't do a very good job of it, still learning a ton. Did the conversion to the F-35, came an F-35 pilot. And then when I got back here to Montgomery, we didn't have our, our jets yet. So I kind of had to go beg, borrow, and steal and go fly with other F-35 units to keep my currencies up until our aircraft finally arrived. So early December, we actually picked them up from Luke Air Force Base or at Luke. There were jets that were destined to go somewhere else. And then just the way, you know, things work, the base that was supposed to get them wasn't ready to receive those airplanes. So they came to us instead. So the first three airplanes came from Luke Air Force Base. So we went out to Luke. That weapons officer I talked about earlier, myself and the wing commander, we brought the, the first three jets in. It was actually pretty awesome. So we had a big arrival ceremony, a moderate size arrival ceremony. The actual official arrival ceremony will be next month. So that'll be kind of a big to-do. So we went through that. I got to fly the first Alabama tail F-35. I'm not the first 100th fighter squadron pilot to bring a jet to Alabama, but I did get to bring the first Alabama tail to Alabama. So um, got to do that. It was a tremendous honor to be asked to do that. The ops group commander asked me to do that, then the wing commander. So I don't know if they just felt like I deserve it because I've been here a long time or just because I know where all the bodies are buried. I don't know what it was, but... A little column A, a little column B. It never hurts. You <laughs> yeah, know? It never hurts. Right. But for whatever reason, they decided to let an old guy uh, bring the first jet in. So that was pretty cool. So I got to be a part of that, which is something I'll obviously always remember. But now we're kind of getting down to business, you know. So all those instructor pilots that we sent out early to get smart on the airplane, they're all back. And now their job is to make us smart on it. So as a pretty experienced 2,500-hour F-16 guy, I went through a relatively abbreviated course on the F-35. It was it was still a healthy amount of time, like four or five months. But it wasn't a full, like, basic course where you get all that training. So a lot of the the mission sets I did I only maybe I did one in the sim and then one in the air that I moved on so even though I've like been familiarized with them I'm still not super good at them yet so it's good to have these young IPs who are here and they're motivated and they have to take an old dog like me and go okay get rid of all that fortune baggage this is how we're going to employ this thing now and kind of teaching me how to be a combat ready F-35 pilot. Corners of the envelope, and obviously we're not going to talk numbers, but compared to your first love, the F-16, where are things the jet excels, maybe things that you'd maybe like different performance or characteristics from? I'm just hoping that comparison, not like you said, some folks are, uh, we'll, we'll call them, what did you say, pure blood? They call themselves pure blood. They call themselves that. that. Okay. Yeah. No. I was going to say that. I, was, I, I make fun of them for that. I prefer actually, the, the babies, uh, but yeah. th their experience compared to yours, they, they only know what they know. You know both. Yeah. Maybe, like I said, F-16 compared to the F-35A. I'm, so, I'm told the F-35 has great brakes by someone. It has amazing brakes. <laughs> Especially for an F-16 pilot. The, the F-16 does not stop well. The, the F-35 has amazing brakes. So the best analogy that I usually share with people is the F-16 is a 1985 Porsche 911. It's older, but it was built for speed. It was built to just hug the curves of the Audubon. Older technology, steam gauge, a lot of round dials and things like that in the car, but and in the F-16, but it just, it was a performer, the soul of a race car. The F-35 is more like a 2023 Tesla Model X. It's a little bit bigger. Like you hit the gas pedal in ludicrous mode or whatever, it'll go real fast in a straight line. But you know, if you're trying to hug the corners on the Audubon, it's probably not gonna quite keep up. So the fifth gen capabilities of the airplane are amazing. Being able to sneak up on guys and have them not even know that you're there. I, I literally rejoined on another fighter and I was just flying off his wing, he had no idea was there. You can never do that in an F-16, right? The fifth gen capabilities are phenomenal. The performance is, it's still really good. It's a fighter jet and the thing burns and, and it turns and it goes and I love it. It just doesn't quite turn like an F-16 and really nothing does. Short of a Raptor, there's not really thing, that many things out there that can really turn like a Viper. So I do miss flying the Viper. You know, if you just said it's a Saturday morning and here's the keys to a jet, I'm going to I'm gonna take the F-16 every single time. Now, I don't know if that's just because I'm just an old Viper dude, but if I was just going to go fly around for fun, I, I would definitely take the Viper. If I was going to go back to like a cast deployment, you know, that stuff we were doing in Afghanistan, Iraq with the Block 30 Big Mouth F-16 with all the avionics upgrades and the Gen 4 Tarny pod, the helmet mounted sight that we had on that, and you know, the CDU and all the different just avionics upgrades, I would take an F-16 back to CAS over the F-35 right now. But if I did anything else in combat aviation, I'll take the F-35. And I think another year or two, a couple new software tapes for the F-35, I'll probably take the F-35 to combat for the close air support fight as well. It's just not quite there yet, but it'll be there pretty soon. And to those that want to dunk on, let's say the F-35, I remember a cartoon in a, back when they had cartoons in newspapers uh, of, I can't remember which lake it was out in Arizona, and the old joke was, you know, drain the lake and the, the bottom, you to pull the plug out of the bottom of the bathtub and there's F-16s in it because they were, <laughs> they were losing 
many, many F-16s early on, oh, yeah. and that airplane has become legendary for how good it is. It takes time. Even the best takes airplane time. takes time of those spiral up development processes. So yeah. that's really, really great. And I'm glad to hear it's been a good experience. I mean, the jets are, again, brand freaking new, and it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful future. Speaking of that future, not all, and again, the Guard is a vast tapestry of differences. There's a lot of unique things in the Air National Guard. I mentioned that to say some units make it very clear on their website they only hire current qualified folks. And y'all hire folks, in some cases off the street, a lot of times from your pool of maintainers and other qualified uh, people here at the unit. For those that are interested in the 100th and coming here, and maybe I'm guessing you've probably sat on more than one selection board and you've seen <laughs> the other side of the table, right? I'm just wondering if we could get a little bit of insight. Don't tell us all the secrets, but maybe a couple, uh, couple nuggets of wisdom from behind the curtain. Well, wow, that's... Um... What alcohol should I bring when I... <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, so the first thing I would say, honestly, is that every guard unit is different. And what we really look for in the guard is fit, because if you're an a-hole in the active duty or you're working with an a-hole in the active duty, in the next two to three years, one of the two of you is going to be gone, right? Like not even out of the Air Force, but you're going to get reassigned or that other a-hole is going to get reassigned. And you're not going to have to deal with them very long. If you're an a-hole in the guard, we got to deal with you for 20 years. So we're, we're very selective about who we bring into the program or to the squadron, but predominantly because we have to find people that we can live with for the next 20 years, right? Now, every guard unit is different. They all have their different personalities. So you may say, hey, I really want to be a Montgomery guy and I really want to fly the F-35 Montgomery. And you may interview or, you know, whomever this imaginary person is. They come here and they can interview with us and, and we can just say, hey, it's not a good fit. Or sometimes the person looking for a job will go, eh, these guys are all weird to me. This isn't the best fit. But then maybe you go somewhere like Burlington and you're like, oh man, I fit in great here. Or you go to Buckley, and you're like, oh, I fit in great here. Sometimes it's how well you fit into a guard unit that really makes the difference. So the best advice I can tell you, honestly, is that if you're going to go rush guard units, first thing I would tell you is actually rush. Take some time, make a couple trips out there, get to know the guys and gals with the squadron, because if they're going to hire you, they want to know you and you don't really get to know somebody in like a 10 or 15 minute interview so i think if you've shown up there a few times you just kind of hung out in the quote-unquote heritage room right if you hung out in the bar and just give the people in that squadron an opportunity to know you and for you to know them you'll figure out you know whether it is a good fit or not and the squadron will figure out whether you'd be a good fit or not and i think that's going to give you the best advantage of actually getting to the squadron just really getting to know people the next thing i would say is when you go to these you know these squadrons to rush just just be yourself just be who you are because like i said you may really want to fly f-35s in montgomery and you may find you're not a good fit but you just your personality might be a really great fit in another squadron. So if you go to those different squadrons and you figure out where you really fit in, it's probably going to be an easy opportunity for you to get hired there because if you fit in with them, they fit in with you, they're going to like you and they're going to want to work with you for the next 20 years and they'll hire you. So I think those two things really kind of set people apart. You kind of have to do the basic stuff, right? You have to take the FOQT, you have to do well on it, you have to get some flight time, things like that, typically, myself not included, but typically you have to have some flight hours and things like that that to get hired so do those things go fly go get your hours go get your ppl or you know your instrument ratings or whatever and go get to know the men and women of the places you want to serve and you know don't throw all your eggs in one basket just don't just say hey i want to be a montgomery guy and just go hang out in montgomery all the time it might work out but you might be missing out on an even better squadron for you somewhere else because you're not kind of getting out there and testing the water so to speak one of the things i find fascinating i think we've all read base ops and some of the some of the threads on there for the guard <laughs> and there's yeah. a thread about questions that y'all will ask during interviews you don't have to give us an answer, but I'm curious. Do you have, uh, I don't know, maybe one or two sheriff questions that you like to ask that uh, you found? Yeah. Like All jokes aside, that you found are insightful into the character of the person you're potentially hiring from. Man, so I'm really giving away my secrets here. but And you don't have to if you don't want to. Well, but I'm that's just, fine. No, I I'm love just this. curious. Yeah. I've actually sat on a lot of boards. And usually what I try to do is I actually try to challenge the interviewee, but in ways that's unexpected. So, you know, you've seen all the bogey dope questions, all that, right? Like guys have their standard questions they ask, and some of them are tough and you have to really have thoughtful answers. Usually what I will do is I'll pull out their resume and I'll go through their resume and I'll find ways to ask challenging questions about their resume. Maybe like a gap in their college career or with my engineering background that we get a lot of technical applicants who come here. So sometimes I can ask pretty pointed engineering questions about specific jobs that they've had or things like that, you know, just to try to give them a little off balance, just see how they handle it, see how they react to it. And I think one of the best things you could actually say in an interview, truthfully, is I don't know. If someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer, hey, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that, but I would love to go find out and get back to you kind of thing. Because one thing about fighter pilots, we could, we could smell bullshit from a mile away, you know? So if you come in here, you try to BS us, we're going to figure it out pretty quick and you're not going to get hired. 
So even if you feel like it's a bad answer, an honest answer will actually take you a lot farther because we know you don't know all the answers. We just want to see if you're going to acknowledge that because the pilots who think they have all the answers and they know everything are usually the ones who get killed or even worse, usually kill somebody else, right? Like, so we really want to see that you have the humility to admit when you don't know something and that you have the work ethic and the wherewithal to go out and try to find those answers. And that's important to us. When we interview, we actually do it over two days. So we can, I can ask you a question and you may not know the answer and you say, well, I'll go find out. And then I'll ask you the next day. I'll be like, hey, it, a lot of times I'll do it with Tuskegee Heritage or things like that, right? So I'll sit back and be like, hey, did you find the answer to that question yesterday? And the ones who come back with the answers, that tells me a lot. So, you know, those are some things I do, but I think my best trick is just pulling stuff directly out of their resume and kind of hitting them with hard questions about their personal life. And um, that seems to, to work pretty well. Does it weigh on you when you're making that decision? Because I'm guessing the folks that are standing in front of you, it's been pointed out to me that not too far away from where we're sitting, there's a major airline hub. Uh, you guys are in many ways the prettiest girl in the bar. Like folks want to come fly here. You have the newest airplanes on the ramp. This is a desirable location. And as a result, you're going to get really highly qualified applicants. And so is it tough to say, hey, maybe this time we only picked one or two or none? Is that a challenging thing to be on the other side of the board and know that you're kind of handing people maybe an answer they don't want to hear? The actual selection process isn't typically that tough. What we will usually find is, you know, however many hundreds of applications we get, we typically we'll narrow it down to about 20 to bring in an interview. And we do score them, right? And if you've hung out with us in the bar a couple of times, then you'll get a few extra points for that. Or if you have a really good AFOQT score, you'll get good points for that. Let's talk about the AFOQT really quick, because this is, for me, this is like a soapbox thing. Oh boy, here we go. So let's, let's say you're interviewing someone to come be a part of the 100 Fire Squadron, and you're looking at their GPAs from college. One of them has a 4.0 GPA, and one of them has a 2.8 GPA. Which one are you going to hire? Probably the 4.0. It uh, it depends. It depends because I need to know more about them. What yeah. was the like? Was it a 4.0 and no offense, underwater basket weaving? Was the 2.8? I'm going to be a nerd here and say in engineering, like you and I have a background in. Shaq. It, it depends is the answer yes. to that question. So I almost, I almost, I, can, I almost got it wrong. Everyone does like 4.0, <laughs> right? Yeah. So if you have a 4.0 in underwater basket weaving, you have a 2.8 in biomechanical engineering. I might be leaning towards the biomechanical engineering guy, but how do I really compare those two people equally? It's the AFOQT, because it's the one standard test that they both take. If you want to go active duty, all you have to do is meet the minimum, and it's fine. If you want to go guard, especially fighters, not as big of a thing in the heavy world, I don't think, but if you want to go fighters, we only have so many ways to differentiate you from other people. And effort on that test shows. And so if you take a couple months, if you go study, do the practice test, you show up with a bunch of 90s plus on your FOQT across the five boards, it's probably going to show well in the interview. And at worst case, we're like, hey, we got these two people really like, and we got this 4.0 and this 2.8, but man, this 2.8 crushes the FOQT and the 4.0 barely made the minimum. It makes it easy for us. So for me, the FOQT is the one common denominator among all our candidates. And so when we're looking at aptitude, like educational aptitude, I guess, for back to better term, that for me, that really stands out. And I give this advice to so many people. I'm like, take the time. You only get two shots at it. Do really, really well the first time and be done with it. And you don't have to put all the pressure on you the second time. Like, oh man, if I screw this up, then you know, it's a wrap for me kind of thing. So that's one of my biggest advice to young people out there is just, if you want to be a fighter pilot in a guard or reserve squadron, take the extra time to do well on the FOQT because that's really the only thing that I can compare you to other people against. They say there's often a story and a call sign. I'm embarrassed to say I actually don't know the story behind yours. Is it one that's uh, fit for uh, fit for for this audience, or is it uh, just maybe a? Uh, I'm also told sometimes folks have two versions of the story: the one they tell, and then maybe the true version. Is Sheriff one we can talk about? We can mostly talk about it. So <laughs> okay, I only have one version of the story. Oh, that's that's folk. Okay. And it's the version, and it's a pretty good story. But the problem with my story is I'm actually named after a very old movie. I'll get to that in the end. But uh, so there I was at my naming. The way namings work, I don't want to give away too many secrets, but the short version is they give you a handler to take care of you. There may or may not be copious amounts of alcohol involved. Allegedly. Can't confirm nor deny. But they give you a handler, someone to kind of take care of you to make sure you're good to go. And then they basically, you know, they bring you in the room, some stuff happens, then they kick you out. They talk about you behind your back and they bring you in the room. Some other stuff happens. They kick you out. They talk about you behind your back. Repeat until you have a call sign, right? That's basically how it works. And so I'm in the middle of this process. I don't know if my handler just had to go use the restroom or whatever, but somehow I snuck away from my handler. And there was another call sign that was 
pretty much had all the traction. And it was a well-earned call sign from flying buffoonery and just like bar buffoonery and things like that, that played on several levels that was totally accurate, that they probably should have named me that. And I probably would have been named that had I not broken away from my handler and snuck into my naming. So I, I sneak into my naming, I'm standing in the corner and I'm just listening to everybody like trash me, right? Which is what we do. And it's all in good fun. It's love. It's not like, you know, super mean stuff. But so I'm just listening to this and finally somebody sees me. Now, I've had, you know, a barley pop or two, right? Someone sees me like, hey, what are you doing here? Get out of here. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, a movie line popped into my brain. My filter has been turned off by the alcohol, so I just blurt it out. I just stand there, I look at him, and I go, where are the white women at? And if you... <laughs> I know exactly yeah. the movie you're referring to. So if you've Cheryl. ever seen Blazing Saddles, <laughs> that's a line from that movie. I don't know why that popped in my little bitty pea pre- brain at the time, but that's what I said. They were like, get out of here. And like five minutes later, I was sheriff. So great movie. That mo- I think that movie was actually released the year that I was born. And I'm an old dude, right? So that's an old movie. So most of the young fighter pilots and stuff right here, they've never seen it. They don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's crazy. That is actually really sad. Yeah. And the fighter world, and specifically in the F-16 community, it's almost right of passage. Like, there's a lot of things that we say and do that are like direct reference from <laughs> Blazing Saddles. So for all you future fighter pilots out there, go watch it. It's really funny. It has a really weird ending, but it's wildly inappropriate and you will probably be offended. And I apologize for sending you out there to watch the movie. But if you want to know where my call sign comes from, you got to go watch Blazing Saddles. That is a fantastic story. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, as we wrap this up, uh, one final parting shot, because I forgot to ask, speaking of patches, Yankee Golf Bravo Sierra Mike. You got to be shitting me. I don't know that I've seen guard guys with wild weasel patches. Is this something maybe I've just missed or something new? Uh, but you've got one on your left shoulder. Yeah. So I'm guessing there's a story there. Well, there's obviously a lot of history behind the wild weasels. Most of that is owned by the F-16s. Not all of it, but most of it is like an F-16 story. And so the wild weasel mission, suppression of enemy air defenses, going out there and seeking out surface air missiles that are trying to destroy you and killing them first or making those guys shoot at you so that your bros can sneak around and go do the mission jump. That's kind of the wild weasel mission. So it was a, a mission that was owned by the F-16 for as long as I've been in the Air Force. And at the time when I first got in, we had CGs and CJs right? So the Block 50s did like the Wild Weasel mission. It's an F-35 squadron. That's a big part of the F-35 mission. So the F-35 was built for the Wild Weasel mission and it's kind of taken over that role. So when you go to F-35 school, a big part of your training is the seed training. You basically become a Wild Weasel. When you finish all your seed flights, they give you your your Wild Weasel patch. So you got to be shit me really comes from the origin. And again, I am brand new to being a weasel guy, right? Because that was not part of our, uh, our doc statement when I was an F-16 guy here. So I'm brand new to seed. But when they first brought the mission up, they're like, hey, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to fly in there and we're going to go fly around. So all the SA-2s and 3s shoot at us or our bros can get in there and and drop bombs get out of there without getting targeted. We're going to do a bunch of maneuvers and try to defeat the missiles before they kill us. And they're briefing it to the guys and someone stands up and is like, "Uh, you got to be shitting me. We're going to go in there and wait in there and get shot at. And so that's where the YGBSM comes from on the patch, on the weasel patch. So there's a lot of pride behind the weasel mission. I'm still kind of, I don't feel like I've fully earned it yet. You know, I'm a current qualified F-35 guy, but I, I still suck at <laughs> seed. So I'm trying to get better at it. I'm working on it. I really suck at everything in this airplane, to be perfectly honest with you. So today we went out, we flew air combat maneuvering, and I didn't do great. I did okay. I didn't crush it, but I didn't, I wasn't terrible. But afterwards, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there with the, the flight lead and we're talking about it. And he's a weapons officer, super strong guy. And he's like, dude, this is literally the second time you've ever flown ACM. And I was like, yeah, it is the second time I've ever flown ACM. You know, I've been flying fighters for so long that I just feel like I want to be good at it right now. It sucks to suck. It's no fun being, you know, the guy who's still learning. But it's like being a brand new lieutenant in a fighter squadron again. Like, I'm learning all over. So um, I'm still learning about the weasel mission. I'm getting better at it. But it's challenging. It's complex. It's fun. It's nuts. It's very dynamic. We do some really high octane stuff. I'm proud to be part of it. And hopefully I'll, I'll get better at it. Well, even as that new guy, and certainly we don't want to talk about any TTPs or anything, but uh, there has been a lot of criticism leveled. And I would I'd probably argue unfairly because, frankly, we have to be in a different room to have the actual conversation about how good the F-35 is at the weasel mission. But is it something that, again, limited experience, I'm, I will throw all the caveats on the front end, just a, an opinion here, but a good friend of mine always taught me the phrase, assume positive 
good intent. I assume that the Air Force has made a very specific decision to assign this mission to this airplane. And I'm guessing it probably does it pretty well. Is that a fair statement? Is it something that's very fair? It does it incredibly well. I do know there's some criticism on the F-35 out there, and I get it. It's an expensive airplane. I think that one thing that people really lose sight of is prior to the F-35, I don't think we ever gave a fighter jet to the end user, i.e. to the Air Force or the Navy or the Marines, whoever you it, as early in the design phase as we did with the F-35, right? Like the first F-35s are out there kind of maybe still flying around places. We'll probably never go to combat. They'll never be combat coded. But the end users, the Air Force, got those jets really, really early. So when you get an airplane in its infancy, there's still a lot of growing pains that have to go with it. I worked for another company before I was flying for my airline and I was doing a lot of engineering work for a major aircraft designer also based in Atlanta and when the F-22 first rolled off the flight line the pilots hated it they hated it like there was a lot of issues with fusion centrifusion and the side stick didn't move at all same thing with the F-16 at first right guys hated that right those kind of little things and guys just didn't like it and then over time it got better better now guys love it like it's an amazing platform I'm glad they're on our side even though it's super old stealth technology and you know, legacy fifth gen. I'm saying it again, legacy fifth gen. <laughs> but yeah, so, I mean, we got the F-35 really early. The F-35 is brand new to us. The Air Force has been operating this thing for like 10 years, like forever, man. Eight years, 10 years, I don't know, for a, a pretty long time. You know, if you really think about it, like that's a long time to be flying an airplane. It still seems like a super brand new airplane. And it's not even anywhere close to being fully filled yet because we're still rolling them off the assembly line. So I think because we got to the airplane so early, it kind of started out with a bad reputation. Everyone's comparing to the F-16. It's like, oh, well, it doesn't turn like an F-16. It's like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't carry as many missiles and bombs and stuff as the F-16. Well, it does externally, right? But you lose your, your stealth capability. You give some of that up internally in order to maintain yourself. So there's pros and cons to it. So the early criticism, I think, has mostly gone away. I'll tell you, like, I couldn't be more proud to be a Panther driver. And I love flying the jet. I've flown it every day this week, and it's been amazing. And, and, you know, I get to go fly tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to doing that as well. I've really enjoyed the experience, and I look forward to actually getting decent at it and uh, being someone that guys kind of look at as, you know, hopefully a leader that can lead them into combat and and operate the airplane in a safe and and executable way that allows us to go out and carry on our mission. So uh, I love flying it. I'm super glad that we have it. I'm super glad it's our side. And I'm actually amazed at the things that I can do in this airplane and the, the amount of situational awareness that I have flying this airplane is it's unbelievable it's almost like cheating hopefully i can get to fly for another 10 years if they let me as long as they let me fly upside down and blow stuff up then i'll kind of hang out here and keep flying the f-35 hopefully i can do that for a while but it's an amazing platform but what i will tell you is whatever chris is out there they just don't know what they don't know and at the end of the day especially now that i'm much older lethality is awesome it's great it's be able to go out there and be lethal and, and carry tons of bombs and shoot a bunch of missiles is amazing but you know what's better than that survivability Getting to come home and talk about it afterwards is way better. So if I got to give up a little bit in lethality to gain exponentially in survivability, I'll take that all day long. So I want to be able to be around, see my kids grow up. And I think the survivability of the F-35 is probably the single most underrated aspect of that airplane. It is highly, highly survivable. The threats that are out there now, the fighters that are being built in Russia and China, and the surface air threats that are being built in Russia and China, they're scary, man. There's a lot of capability out there. So being in something that's super survivable, I think is, I'm thankful for that piece of it for sure. So I think that's very important and often overlooked. You mentioned leadership a second ago, and I want to make sure we circle back to that as we kind of start to close out. Being in the unit here so long, you've seen lots of different aviators, some that are prior service, perhaps active duty folks that come over to the Guard, folks that you kind of grow here in the unit from enlisted all the way up to folks that are flying on your wing or you're flying on their wing. I'm guessing there were some maybe good and bad examples over the years of folks that you looked at and said, that's maybe I don't want to be that kind of person or that's the type of person I want to be as a leader. Any good stories, any good role models? It's just kind of sometimes I think those stories are the best way to convey this is the kind of leader that I want to be in this kind of yeah. the instructor I want to be in the you know the flight lead and all, and all those all those different jobs yeah I, it's kind of a weird thing especially as you know I start moving in a lot of these leadership roles out here but I've definitely had some really good leadership I've definitely had some poor leadership and it's I think another analogy maybe a little bit risque right but you know it's like I can't explain to you what pornography is but I know it when I see it so saying like what makes someone a good leader 
I can't tell you exactly what makes someone a good leader, but I know it when I see it. But what I can tell you is what makes someone a bad leader. And so those traits really stand out. You know, as I've kind of matured and, and been doing this for a while, and they've had a lot of great squadron commanders, ring commanders, op group commanders, there are certain things I stand out. I'm like, when I'm in charge, I'm not going to do that, right? Or a couple of things where I'm like, oh yeah, hopefully I can remember to do that when I get put in those positions. But, you know, I did the squadron commander thing for a while and it, and it was awesome, you know, just looking for possibly other opportunities to leave. But right now I was a squadron commander. I kind of handed the squadron over and then I went straight to F-35 school and I just got to be a lieutenant, right? I got to make popcorn and just go to the sim and, and just go to the vault and study and just learn. And I'm loving that. So I know, I think there might be some other plans for me in the future, but right now I'm just super thankful. I get to come to work and all I have to worry about is being the best F-35 pilot I can be. So, you know, that's my focus right now. I'm going to do as much as that as I can. And if the wing needs me to do other things, they'll, they'll tell me and right. The needs of the Air Force are still a thing. And uh, if they need me to step up and do other things, then I will. But for the time being, I'm just super happy to the that they haven't fired me yet. They're still letting me fly the F-35. Honestly, I, I wish I could say, hey, this is all the stuff that makes someone a good leader because I would just do those things. I'd be this great leader, right? Yeah. But it's, you know, theory and practical application are two very different things. And you can read all the leadership books you want, but until, you know, that airman stand in front of you with whatever problem that they have or caused or whatever the case may be, you don't really know how to handle it. Now, the beauty of the National Guard is more than most military services, we really care about our people, right? As a commander, there were guys that did things that I could have very easily fired for. And honestly, some I probably should have, right? But I'm much more interested in rehabilitating these guys. If they have stumbles and fumbles, because we all do. And I know their families. I, I know their spouses. I know their kids. We have a, a really good friend of mine. In fact, when I was a brand new lieutenant here, kind of one of the older pilots that kind of took me under his wing, he's our maintenance group commander now. And he's got three kids. And I remember when his, his kids were just babies. And now his son is a crew chief out here, a crew in jets, right? So I was actually the first pilot that he launched out as a crew chief here. I'm like, I remember when this kid was two years old. Now he's launching me on an F-16 sortie. So this is your family, man. It really is family. And for all the good stuff that the active duty does and the great relationships that guys build there, it's just a family dynamic in the guard. It's just really difficult to find other places because you just know people so well for so long. So that's really good. We really take care of each other. We really fight for each other, which makes it super special. But sometimes it works out great. And I'm like, man, I'm really glad I fought for that guy. Other times it's, you know, maybe I give people a little bit too much leeway when I shouldn't, but all things being equal, I'd rather give guys an extra chance than to take away somebody's potential. And we have that luxury in the guard, which maybe you don't have on the active duty. So. As we wrap up, uh, I keep promising we're going to wrap up. As we wrap up, Sheriff, I always like to end these with two things. First off is gratitude. Thank you for taking so much time. For those that don't know, we've known each other for a hot minute. I want to say 2011, maybe before then. I was just some dumb kid at the airport with a camera, and you oh, were... So hold on. Can you tell... Can you Because I... I can tell my version if you want to yeah, tell. Yeah, tell okay. this story. Because okay. one, I've been talking this whole time. And, and two... <laughs> so I prefer it, actually. Because we talk about these young guys we get to watch grow up that I'm super proud of. You're, you're one of those guys. Because, I mean, we met when you were still in college. You were just a civilian, so... Let me hear your side of I'll, that I'll story. Talk, I'll tell you my All version. Right. So I love military aircraft, and I was a college student at Tennessee Tech, and Tennessee Tech is halfway between Nashville and Knoxville, so I would spend many a Friday and Sunday, because I knew there was a military aircraft movement on Fridays and Sundays, either driving to Nashville or Knoxville. One of the other cheat codes I had in Nashville, I knew that the Titans did flyovers for the football games. And so uh, I won't mention their names, but there's two gentlemen, they were very, very nice guys. And it was uh, kind of reached out like, hey, I'd love to just take photos for free. You know, happy to give you whatever I get. And it evolved later. I think it was after your flyover. Um, they'd send me a Titans flag. I'd give it to them. We'd take photos of the flag, you know, with the jet, with the guys. They'd put it in the jet. They'd fly over the stadium with it. And then they'd present that to the team every game, right? That was kind of an idea I had. Like, hey, what's something unique, visual, you know, whatever. But at, I can't remember which flyover it was. Hey, it's four jets from Alabama, F-16. Oh, that's awesome. I want to see these airplanes. They were on the 118th airlift wing. They'd lost their C 130s, but on the guard ramp, they were not as friendly as I would have hoped to get me out there. And as I recall, uh, you just made a phone call. And I don't know if it was you or your crew chiefs, people just swung by, picked me up. You guys fired up, went and did your flyover, came back. And this might sound like a silly point, but I did want to make sure I mentioned it. For whatever reason, right or wrong, buckle up, because here it comes. 
F-16 guys have a bit of a reputation. It's generally not always for being like the nicest folks. And you have been nothing but nice to me over the years. And I very much appreciate that. I'm not just saying that because we're sitting here, you know, together. I'm saying that because it really is the truth. We had four year jets to a flyover for a little air show that I, I helped work on in, in Tullahoma. And we called more than just you. We called other folks. <laughs> and y'all were the only ones who were like, yeah, we'll make it happen. Well, I think the, the, the team made a, a bit of a weekend of it for our 4th of July air show. So I've always had a special place in my heart for this place, for these airplanes and for you because of the friendship because I'm just some dude like let's let's be clear the amount of people that see these airplanes that see this unit that want to come here that list is a mile long I'm certain but the fact that you have stayed in touch and uh, it means an incredibly large amount to me I, a friend of mine sent me some photos of uh, the first photos of the Alabama jets flying out west I just thought hey this is really cool I'll bet sheriff would like it and you're like yeah that was me flying I'm bringing the jets home in a week and I was just like yeah of course you are yeah that makes perfect sense I saw the video on the 2014 deployment in Afghanistan incredibly impressive to me whoever did that kudos to them and I'll, I'll make sure I put a link in the podcast here so you can see that but that's my version of the story if you remember anything else or uh, yeah. uh, you, can, you can add those details for sure I'm sure that's about right I remember I, I do remember the skinny punk kid like kind of like, hey man, can I take photos of your airplanes or whatever? But dude, I think that's awesome. Like anyone who has an interest in aviation, I'm always there to encourage it. You know, we all started somewhere. We all had someone that was kind of nice to us at some point in time doing something. And you just, you never know the influence that you can have on someone just by taking a couple minutes and, you know, just having a conversation with them and throwing them an RMO or a patch or something, right? So I clearly, I didn't have enough of influence because you went Navy instead of Air Force or even better yet, the Guard. So I don't know uh, what I did wrong there, but I'll work on my presentation so that the next young guy walking up, taking pictures of the jet and say, let me talk to you about the Guard a little bit, but... But I tried. I tried my best to get you. To you go. certainly did. Yeah. As I recall, y'all were not hiring at the time, and I did have my heart set on Alabama. So, yeah. Yeah. No, all jokes aside, there's still time. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> um, first off, like I said, gratitude. Thank you so much for the time, for the friendship. But second off, as we close these out, you get the last word. Anything maybe I didn't ask, or anything you wanted to say? Um, again, we talked about absolutely the, the foundation, the wonderful things you do there. So I want to plug that for sure. But uh, like I said, Sheriff, over to you. You get the last word. The only thing I really want to say is just thank you to you for you know, having me on and taking the time to, you know, drive all the way to Montgomery to sit down and chat with me and twice. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, all that you've done, like I said, dude, it's, it's been really awesome just kind of watching your career, watch you go from rotary to fixed wing, just seeing the stuff that you post, like all the cool things that you're doing, all the people that you're reaching out, right? Like I reach out through my scholarship, you're reaching out through your podcast, dude, I'm super honored to be your friend. I'm super proud of the things that you've done and the things that I, I know you're going to do. And you're, you're heading off to a new assignment here pretty soon. I don't know how much your listeners are, are tracking that, but dude, you're going to do great things. We expect, you know, good things for the, the needs of the Navy. We expect good things for the podcast. And, you know, you'll probably meet a whole new group of amazing people with amazing stories. And I look forward to tuning in to to hearing about those folks as well. So, you know, thanks for taking the time and the effort that it goes into producing, you know, this, this show and tracking people down and driving all over with equipment and doing hours and hours and hours on ed of editing just so we can get, so I don't sound like a complete idiot. I'm gonna sound like a moron no matter what you do, but I just sound only a little bit dumb because you're gonna go in there and do all the hard work and the editing that really makes this podcast pop. So thanks for doing that. Thanks for being an advocate and, and a voice of uh, just us war fighters and, and guys who just kind of put our lunch in a pail and go to work every day and just try to make life a little bit better for those in America. So glad to be your friend, proud of everything you're doing, man. I look forward to all the stuff that you're going to accomplish moving forward. So I'll be tuning in. I'll be watching. Awesome. Thanks. I sure. guess I'll be listening. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, as always, for taking the time and tuning in to Safe on Deck. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It shouldn't need to be said, but just in case, I'll say it. The views and opinions presented on Safe on Deck are my own and those of my guests and do not represent the official policy or position of the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, or its components. Be well, blue skies, and fly safe out there. See you next time. DCL idle, wings level, clear, we're safe on deck.